That one. Yeah. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, it's 10 o'clock, so I'm going to start the meeting. And um, welcome to the meeting today of the Suffolk Health Scrutiny Committee. I am Councillor Jessica Fleming, and I'm chairing the meeting today. This meeting is being broadcast live and is available to watch on the Council's website while we're in public session. 
A recording of the meeting will also be available for subsequent viewing. Members of the public and the press may record, film, photograph or broadcast this meeting when the public and the press are not lawfully excluded, provided due courtesy and respect are shown to others in attendance, in line with the Council's published guidance. We are not expecting a fire drill today. In the event of an alarm sounding, please leave the chamber following the fire exit signs at the rear. Fire evacuation instructions can also be found on page four of the agenda. May I remind you to please speak clearly into the microphone and avoid placing things such as papers or equipment in front of the microphone as this will affect the sound quality on the broadcast and in the chamber. And may I also ask you to turn your mobiles and laptops onto silent if you have not already done so. Thank you. Item one is public participation, and there have been no applications to speak today. Apologies for absence and substitutions. Julia, are there any apologies? Um, we've had apologies of absence from Councillor Julie Flatman. Thank you, Julie. Declarations of interest and dispensations. Do members of the committee have any declarations or dispensations, please? You could raise your hand. Um, Councillor Maybury. Um, yes, um, it is later on when we are looking at the childhood obesity, just to record that one of the um, experts, um, Lisa Dalton, I vaguely know. She's not a friend, but I do know her. Thank you. We will note that. <clears throat> Agenda item four is the minutes of the previous meeting held on the 25th of January of this year. Are members of the committee intend to approve the minutes of the last meeting? General affirmation, please. Thank you. Um, we come now to our main item today, <coughs> which is um, the maternity services in Suffolk. This item provides the committee with an opportunity to consider the current challenges faced within the maternity services and how these challenges are being addressed. The committee will be aware from reports and media coverage that many of these challenges are being experienced at a national level. This item focuses on services, especially at Ipswich Hospital and West Suffolk Hospital. Members will be aware that James Paget Hospital is currently in the process of finalizing a CQC report on maternity services, and the committee may wish to invite them to a future meeting once this process has concluded. Um, and there is an information bulletin about James Paget in our pack as well. Um, <clears throat> but firstly, I would like to invite our witnesses to briefly introduce themselves. Um, Dr. Giles Thorpe, would you, and we'll go along the line. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fleming. Uh, uh, good morning, Council Members. My name is Dr. Giles Thorpe. I'm the Chief Nurse at East Suffolk and North Essex NHS Foundation Trust, uh, which includes Ipswich and Colchester Hospitals. I'm also the Maternity Executive Board Safety Champion. Thank you. And um, Justinia? Lovely, thank you. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, my name is Justina Skonieczna. I'm a Deputy Head of Midwifery at uh, West Suffolk uh, Hospital. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa? Thank you. Hello, I'm Lisa Nobes. I'm the Chief Nurse for um, Suffolk and North Essex ICB, and I'm the Senior Responsible Officer for the Maternity System. So I oversee maternity services across primary care, mental health, and our acute services. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and we have, um, joining us remotely, we have Mel Lewis, who chairs the Ipswich and East Suffolk Maternity Voices Partnership. Um, Mel, can you introduce yourself? Good morning, everyone. Hopefully you can all hear me. My name is Mel Lewis, and I am the chair of the Ipswich and East Suffolk Maternity Voices Partnership, as you said. I'm here today really to comment on, on Ipswich Hospital, but I also am representing the MVP chairs from both Suffolk and North East Essex um, for the purposes of this meeting. Thank you. 
thank you, and thank you very much for joining us. Um, we also have Karen Newbury. I'm head of midwifery at West Suffolk Hospital. Um, she will be joining us a little late following um, conclusion of a meeting. Um, in terms of how we're going to approach the um, scrutiny item, um, I will invite um, Dr. Thorpe to make introductory comments, um, and then I will um, <coughs> invite West Suffolk Hospital, um, Karen, if she's here, um, to make some, some comments. Um, and Justinia, you may want to go ahead if Karen isn't, um, isn't here um, in any case. And um, <clears throat> we'll hear comments from Lisa Nobes and from Mel Lewis. Um, and then I may um, invite Andy Yakub from Health Watch Suffolk to um, add any comments on behalf of Health Watch before turning the meeting over to the committee members. So um, Giles, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, council members will have received the report from uh, ESNEFT and Ipswich Hospital uh, in relation to our maternity services at the current time. Um, I, I think initially to note, following the uh, inspection which occurred in January 2021, uh, the CQC rating had been moved from good to requires improvement, although it, I think it is important to note that there were no urgent concerns about the safety of women or their babies during the inspection process. As an organisation, we moved forward with uh, a, a, a programme board which continues today, known as Every Birth Every Day, which is chaired by the Chief Executive of the Trust, and I am the Deputy Chair. Um, there have been some challenges in relation to maternity services, the details of which have been provided within the report. Uh, the first of those in relation to nitrous oxide, and of course there has been a lot of publicity in relation to nitrous oxide across maternity services nationally. Um, I am pleased to report to, uh, uh, to the committee uh, that the issues at Ipswich Hospital have been resolved and continue to be resolved. There have been no adverse effects to either the staff uh, and there have not been adverse effects to uh, any women who have delivered at Ipswich Hospital in relation to nitrous oxide. Um, in relation to uh, our vacancies, I am pleased to report to the Council that we are predicting a zero whole time equivalent vacancy rate of midwives uh, in February. We are undertaking a further review of maternity staffing known as Birth Rate Plus. Uh, and we will be moving forward with a small increase in the whole time equivalence now that we've had the final report received, which is basically an additional seven midwives, but that is across both hospital sites. Uh, we have also successfully appointed our Director of Midwifery, uh, who actually starts with us on the 8th of May, which we're, and we're very pleased to welcome her as part of the senior leadership team. Uh, also, on the, on the uh, issue of staff career development and well-being, um, I, I think it's fair to, to note that uh, cross health services, I think the challenges with COVID, uh, recovery, uh, and, and uh, obviously now as we've moved forward with industrial action, uh, the well-being of our staff has of course remained a priority. Uh, we have done an awful lot of work uh, within our maternity and neonatal services, ensuring the emotional health and well-being of our staff. We have a very robust well-being team in place in the organisation. Uh, and as, as well, we have um, uh, offered, uh, had support offered to us from the Nursing and Midwifery Council, uh, who uh, are doing a specific piece of work around culture in our maternity uh, departments to ensure that we have strong multidisciplinary team working uh, across our services. As well as that, there are a number of research projects which are underway and we are supporting people to develop clinical academic careers and have successfully appointed two consultant midwives that are leading PhD studies uh, into uh, a variety of different issues around equality, diversity and inclusion and outcomes of uh, pregnant people and families across Ipswich and East Suffolk and North East Essex. Leadership is absolutely key uh, in, in relation to maternity services and visibility of senior leadership so that staff know that their concerns are raised early and heard is of vital importance. As the Maternity Executive Board Safety Champion, I undertake regular uh, visits to the maternity services and speak to midwives, to women and families to ensure that the care that they're receiving is the care that they would expect to receive and also that our staff are feeling well supported uh, in the work that they do. 
Um, uh, there are regular monthly drop-in sessions that, uh, that I hold as well as with the senior leadership team. Uh, and we report those through the Every Birth Every Day programme board uh, and some councillors here uh, do attend that meeting so we'll have heard my updates from staff um, uh, uh, to provide assurance that when staff do raise concerns they are acted on appropriately and robustly uh, so, so that we continue to drive improvement. I think those would probably be the key things that I, that I would want to raise as I'm sure council members have already read the report and after everybody has put forward their statements uh, then of course I'm happy to answer any questions. But I think one of the things that I'd like to conclude by saying is that maternity, service, maternity and neonatal services remain an absolute key focus in the organisation. Uh, they are a benchmark of safety standards which we recognise from national reports. We have recently received, of course, the three-year maternity and neonatal delivery plan, which was published by NH NHS England on the 30th of March, and of course you will have received this report prior to that publication. Uh, and we have already started work on ensuring that we are undertaking action to meet uh, the requirements from the neonatal and, uh, and maternity delivery plan. And, and until we are assured uh, that the standard that we expect to see is consistent and sustained, this will continue to remain a focus within the Trust. I'll conclude at that point. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, um, Giles. Thank you. Um, Justine, would you like to continue on for West Suffolk Hospital? Yes, thank you very much. So the paper presented um, was uh, to show our position when it comes to the progress that has been made within maternity service at West Suffolk Hospital following um, CQC inspection that we uh, had undertaken back in 2019 and the improvement that have been made since then into a quality and safety of the service uh, provided. Um, during this time, a lot of uh, changes has been happening and have been put in place to increase um, staffing situation and also to put the uh, appropriate um, systems in place to make sure that we can evidence and support the provision of safe high quality uh, care. Um, despite all the changes we obviously still um, experiencing some challenges which were included in a paper uh, submitted and those were mainly around the workforce we're still struggling with fully filling our vacancy uh, rate um, and although a lot of the, uh, work has been done around this including including the international recruitment of the midwives, which we are undertaking uh, in collaboration with East of England. Um, we're also doing like an open days event to recruit more midwives into the service, and we're looking at expansion of the students' places, looking at other ways of um, bringing the students in by uh, increasing the places of shorten courses, longer courses, as well as return to practice uh, midwifery. Um, those haven't been, um, we we haven't seen the uptake we were hoping for, therefore at the moment the international recruitment seems to be the, the, the way uh, forward. So we have recruited so far uh, 14 internationally recruited midwives, 10 have already arrived and three of them have received their MMC registration. So they are registered as a fully qualified midwives within the um, uh, Nursing and Midwifery Council in the UK, but they're just going through the period of supernumerary status to familiar themselves with the practice in the UK. And the remaining eight, are, uh, the remaining seven are going through the what we call OSCE preparation course, so they can submit, they can uh, undertake in the exam within the MMC uh, to f complete their registration. And we're expecting another um, four to arrive between next week and middle of, of June. We are still looking into recruitment because following that we will still have some vacancy and our aim is to, to uh, recruit into um, being able to go live with the continuity of, of care. Um, so that is still work in the progress as well as recruitment of the students. Um, another big challenge is reducing the risk of preterm uh, birth as well as uh, reducing postpartum hemorrhages which is national um, ambitions and uh, most of the trusts are facing the same challenges when it comes to those two areas. Um, and the data collection, so the aim for the maternity service is to go uh, paperless. We have introduced a new ITE care system um, and uh, in April 
2021. Um, and that's sometimes when you move from one system to another that can uh, cause quite a lot of difficulties with making sure everything is transferred from one system to another before the data can be pooled so it can be seen as uh, accurate uh, data. So that's, that's something that we're still working on, which has been included in, in the paper. However, um, just to conclude, we've had a few uh, external visits undertaken at West Suffolk Maternity Service through uh, East of England Maternity um, uh, Committee as well as our local LMNS service, which have uh, all commented on the progress that have been made since the CQC inspection. Although the overall CQC inspection for the service hasn't changed, it's still as required in improvements, but some areas identify with the uh, uh, 2019 inspection were changed from one rating to another. Um, we are expecting another CQC inspection anytime soon, so we're hoping it will potentially change. <laughs> Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, I think um, we'll move through the speakers um, before we, we turn to questions. Um, Lisa, would you like to add anything? I would thank you, Councillor Fleming. Um, I just wanted to maybe just very briefly explain the role of the local maternity board, because although our acute and community services do a, a huge amount of the work on the maternity pathway, as we all know, pregnancy starts preconception and goes on way past uh, actually the, the, the midwifery end. So. In the maternity board, we have our MVP and Health Watch colleagues, we have public health, we have our early years colleagues from Suffolk County Council, and there's a much wider range of people that work with us on actually how do we give children the best start in life, how do we support pregnant people and their families to have the best pregnancy delivery and um, the, the initial period of their child's life. So some of the work that we've been doing is working on the preconception pathway. Actually, how do we get people pregnancy ready? That starts really from teenage years. How do we, how do we support education? How do we work with our colleges and universities to make sure that people are ready for pregnancy? We've been doing a huge amount of work with particular groups that we know have increased risk during pregnancy and childbirth. So we've commissioned six voluntary organizations, African families in the UK, a number of, a number of different organizations that work very specifically with people who we know can suffer poorer outcomes. In Ipswich, we have a coordinator that works specifically with the Romani community and has done amazing work and we know that following the introduction of, of that worker, actually our preterm births in that community has significantly decreased. So just by having somebody that kind of works with that, with that group. We do a lot of work with public health. We have started a really innovative model working with Esneft and West Suffolk on smoking cessation in pregnancy. So. <coughs> Uh, we, were, we were really kind of distraught that our smoking at time of delivery figures were between, between 6 and 14 percent, depending on time of year and, and across the sites. We've started a piece of work that actually is a family approach to smoking cessation. So we don't just deliver smoking cessation services to the pregnant person, we deliver it to the family members as well, so that the whole household um, has, has the input and the support from midwives and smoking cessation workers. So that's just really a flavour. Obviously, we, we focus a huge amount on the safety agenda in the hospitals, and I would concur with both my colleagues that workforce has been a, a, a real issue, but it does feel like we're kind of turning the curve on that. And maternity scrutiny is absolutely huge. We, 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 you know, we work very closely with them. Um, but we're very cognizant that primary care, mental health services, and everybody has skin in the game of, of, of making sure that the children have the best start in life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mel, would you like to um, add your comments, please? Certainly. 
So I think probably the most important thing to note is for councillors who may not be aware that the Maternity Voices Partnership, um, affectionately known as the MVP, is an independent body, albeit funded by the um, LMNS, so by the ICB, um, to provide independent service user feedback to the um, ICB and to the Trust to ensure that service user voice is a huge part of the future of maternity services. We do work very closely with both the LMNS and the Trust, so I do just want that to be known, that we do have a close collaborative working relationship, and I do believe, as a chair, that um, both of those bodies take service user feedback incredibly seriously, albeit that there is always work to be done to embed that within um, ranks throughout both of those organisations and really make service user voice part of the culture um, of maternity and neonatal services. But we do work incredibly closely um, with both of those organisations. Um, predominantly, the role of the MVP equally has its challenges as an independent body that's mainly made up of um, lay people, service user representation. Um, we obviously have been reliant quite heavily on volunteers over recent years and in the last 18 months especially, the uh, role required of the MVP um, has increased. We are now more involved in assurance than we have ever been before, attending things like Ockenden visits around the hospital, being closely more involved in CQCs, and equally running our own, um, what we call 15 steps, but on-site visits, making sure that we are also going around and having our own views about what's actually happening on the ground within the hospital setting. Equally, the MVP has formally focused mostly on what happens within the hospital setting, but I think it's fair to say that we are now wanting and, and increasingly the workload is more around, as Lisa said, what happens post being discharged from hospital, for example, and how that continuity of care in the postnatal period um, is also handled and what services are, are delivered. We are involved in multiple work streams, so we attend multiple meetings at both Trust and LMNS levels, and we also go out and gather our service user feedback in multiple ways, be that through actively going and holding events, going out to areas, um, mother and baby uh, groups, for example, um, antenatal classes to seek feedback, and equally through our own uh, survey and other feedback mechanics. But yes, it's fair to say that the work of the MVP is equally under threat slightly from a funding perspective because as the role of the MVP increases, clearly we cannot rely on volunteer hours um, much more. And there's also been an independent review of MVPs nationally. So again, it's not just a, a local regional issue but of discrepancy between how MVPs across the country are funded and the work that they are able to deliver. So I don't think that that's been um, circulated. So if anyone does want to see that, then more than happy to send that through to um, but I just think it's important to know that we do work very closely with um, the LMNS and the trusts on this, and we do believe that they take service user voice very seriously. Um, but our role is to collect more and input that into service delivery on an ongoing basis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mel. Um, Mel, before we, I move on, um, you, ha you haven't told us much about what you've actually found from your survey work and um, um, in what... What is the state of the services according to the work that your volunteers have done, for instance? Survey work is ongoing and we, uh, we collect service user feedback on a whole host of issues. We obviously also monitor those reports and service user feedback that's collected from the likes of the CQC and Ockenden. Um, we tend to find reports back from service users around place of birth, birth choices, quality of postnatal care. We hear a lot from service user voice around not feeling that they have had the adequate information to make informed choices about where and how they give birth. Um, we do a lot of work with people gathering feedback about their induction experience, induction of labour experience. Um, equally, we do a lot of work around infant feeding and making sure that people feel that they are given the support that they need in order to um, understand their choices with infant feeding and support in order to make infant feeding easier for them and postnatal care as well. So as I said, that, that continuity of care between when they might leave or be discharged from hospital and seeing a health visitor, there's a lot of feedback that we get around that transition, whether that transition is smooth or not. 
In the main, we have seen improvements in the feedback that we get, but I would say that those are still the key issues that we are seeing, potentially negative feedback in terms of respect for birth choices, information provision for birth choices, quality of care and people within the system being able to support people adequately in the postnatal period. Um, and induction of labour continues to be a big source of frustration for service users who don't feel they are given a choice or who don't feel they have adequate information to make that choice. I hope that helps answer your question. Thank you. That was very helpful. Thank you. Um, let's turn now to um, Andy Yacoub to add any comments. Thank you, Andy. Health Watch. Can you hear me from here, or do I need to move? Um, thank you for inviting me to, to speak. As you know, Healthwatch has a, a generic role across the whole of health and care. Um, this is quite an unusual situation in that you have, or we have, we're lucky to have maternity and sometimes maternity and neonatal voices partnerships out there uh, at all our hospitals that uh, cover Suffolk. Um, so we tend not to be sought out for commission work around maternity um, but we do pay attention to what the public tell us um, and so we occasionally provide reports to the system uh, we did so for example in uh, about a year ago actually uh, we looked back at comments that we'd received over a period of two years um, and as always we provide a, a paper on our findings and there were four specific things that came over from uh, I think it was just under 180 people that uh, left messages with us. One about staff attitudes and how often a feature of comments and positive interaction from staff at all levels can make a big difference to a person's overall experience. Uh, postnatal care and support, that's about ensuring that people receive specific support for things like breastfeeding, uh, mental health uh, and practical support with baby care, uh, both within the hospitals and the community. Um, we just heard some of that. Um, information about treatment and feeling involved. Uh, so ensuring that people feel heard and have their concerns responded um, to, especially during or after birth, uh, and receiving crucial information about treatment and the care um, at the right time. And Mel's uh, specifically covered that at the end. Uh, and of course, uh, around staff capacity, which we've uh, again heard from uh, our colleagues this morning. More recently, Healthwatch England um, coordinated a, a survey uh, nationally and invited all, all Healthwatch to promote it, as we did. Um, and that's referred to in the paper. Um, I'm not going to go through that, but I, I was quite interested to, to pick up on one particular key issue uh, that um, some mothers or mothers-to-be were raising, and that is if they were, for instance, receiving medication for mental health. Uh, they weren't always told whether or not to stop and what might happen, or told to stop and what might happen. Um, and it has to happen in a timely way. So that's one of the key recommendations that's being made by Healthwatch England. We're, not, we're, not, we're no longer on the uh, uh, local maternity and neonatal group. We haven't been since November. I don't know why, but it's not a, too much of an issue because we're so stretched and I don't even know whether or not we'd be able to attend. But it's good to know that uh, people like Mel are there uh, for the, the service user voice. Um, and the last thing I was just going to say was on the 2nd of May, I'm meeting with the chief exec of the Paget uh, to talk about their latest CQC report, uh, which is out, but it's not public yet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, I, I guess I'd, I've realized now I possibly should declare an interest because my, um, my daughter is actually a nurse at Ipswich Hospital and had been involved in a vo as a volunteer for the uh, Maternity Voices Partnership. Just, um, you know, it's, <coughs> probably should make that clear. Um, I'll pass that over now to the committee and I'm going to go through um, each member in turn um, so that everyone has a chance to speak. Um, so Councillor um, Sawyer, I'll 
if you could, Heidi, if you could please start, and then Thank I'll you. move along the row. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, Andy, I believe all the points you raised are absolutely um, well known by the panel we have invited. Mm -hmm. I don't think there are any new points you made. Um, to the panel, thank you very much for coming. And Thierry, th thank you very much for updating us. Um, I am absolutely delighted to hear that you recruited new staff. Um, one question is, how do you keep the staff? So what I mean is, what sort of benefits or what sort of incentives, for example, food and free drinks, do you offer your staff to keep the turnover low? And the other question I have is, um, I think national there is a sort of aim to increase the ultrasounds a pregnant woman has. I'm not too sure about this, please do advise me. Um, do you think of getting more ultrasound people involved as well? Thank you. I'm happy to, I'm happy to answer that. So, um, Obviously, maternity has seen quite a lot of changes, especially with, thing, with um, since since COVID. So, when it comes to keeping our staff, uh, when it comes to West Suffolk, we've got a um, few intensive in place. So, starting from offering them a free car park, a free tea and coffee overnight. We've jet, we're going to stop, but they uh, stopped that now. But they were also had a meals offered, free meals overnight. At the moment, we're offering free breakfast to help with the cost of living. On top of that, we're also offering our staff a free membership at the gym when they can use the gym and uh, swimming pool facility and um, a, like a different type of classes there uh, as well. Um, when it comes to specific to uh, maternity, we've got our retention lead in place who's working uh, quite closely with um, staff. We've undertaken the staff survey, which showed that usually uh, around two, three years post-qualification, uh, midwives tend to have a little bit of um, thinking about is this is the career that they want to continue with. So we are now looking at having a one-to-one -one conversation with those people, seeing if there's anything that makes them feel that they would want to change just to keep those sort of stay in conversation, how we can support them in staying in. We do have a monthly um, unit meeting when Karen, as head of midwifery, presents what is happening in the, in the unit, what are the projects that we're currently working. There is open forum for staff to raise any concern, questions um, uh, with us at the time as well. We uh, separate, we also have a forum for band seven, band six, and band five midwives because it has been recognized that sometimes they feel much easier to speak up when they're in a group of their own, uh, at their own level rather than being in a bigger, bigger group. Um, we have been undertaking regular staff survey as a trust was undertaking the uh, regular survey and the outcome of those are being looked at and actions plan being put in place to highlight any concerns that have been raised. <coughs> Um, safety champion, we've got regular safety champion walk about, that's usually um, once a month and our safety champions that are, are in a place are at the um, executive level as well as not executive level. Um, so if staff got any concern that they can raise them with um, a safety champion that put, uh, we will then put on our overarching action plans and they are being presented at the trust board to uh, raise the awareness of what's happening with the maternity service and what we are doing about um, answering or, or highlighting or putting actions in place for those concerns raised. Freedom to speak uh, up. We've got staff who um, on the shop floor who are trained uh, as a freedom to speak up champions and also as a trust we do have a freedom to speak up champions that are, have been uh, promoted quite heavily just to allow people to have, if they don't feel that they want to speak with their colleagues, to have someone else outside of the maternity that they can also uh, speak to. Um, our RC uh, Royal Coach of uh, Midwives uh, rep does um, what we call safe space. It's a for open forum run by um, 
external party, so it's usually the ASEAN rep, for people to for staff to come and uh, have a conversation about any concern that they would like to raise with them or questions and things like that. So there's a lot of different things that we've got in place to support the retention of, of staff so they feel um, that they, their voices are being heard and the concern that they're raising are being uh, listened to and actioned. Uh, Lisa, do come in. Thank you. Sorry, I'll just jump in front of Giles. Um, the other thing, because you're absolutely right, the, um, we, we can't keep recruiting and not retain our staff. Otherwise, what happens is you get a very junior workforce if, because, you know, you, you tend to um, lose midwives that have the experience. So we have a retention midwife across the system who is just working on retention. And when, when we speak, when she's spoken to midwives, there tends to be three areas. They want access to training, education and support. And we've done a lot of funding of our maternity and our obstetric because I think we have to remember um, maternity isn't just about midwives, it's about the obstetricians as well. They're a massive part of maternity <coughs> services. They want, um, they want to feel supported, so all the things that Justine has said, and I know Giles will say, they want to feel that they have somewhere to go for support when they've had a difficult time and they want to be supervised. And they want nice spaces to have their breaks. They want to, you know, they, they want... So we were lucky to have some regional funding that we've passed on to the trust to be able to invest even more in the education, the supervision and updating and giving a lick of paint to their, some of their environments. Thank you. Good, thank you. And Giles? Th uh, thank you. Um, uh, thanks, Lisa. Um, so I think, um, similarly to Justina, if I, if I might just pick up some slightly different points around retention, uh, and this will be around our leaders uh, in maternity and neonatal services, I think we cannot underestimate the value of clinical supervision, uh, which gives an opportunity for our leaders to be able to reflect. Um, our, our midwives and obstetricians deal with very, very distressing situations uh, sometimes, uh, and it's been really important to offer a space through which our leaders who are often managing teams of other midwives who are leaning on them for support and guidance when things might not necessarily go as well as we would hope them to go. So, so for us at ESNEF, certainly one of the things that we've done is, has been setting in some specific clinical supervision and mentorship for senior leaders. So they have a, a, have a space to debrief, to reflect, and then to be able to move forward and lead those teams um, uh, uh, for the future. We also have professional midwifery advocates who are in place, and I know they're, they're also in place at West Suffolk. We've recently appointed a lead PMA that will also then offer a greater capacity for clinical supervision, not only within the hospitals, but we must also remember the community teams. So we have many midwives that are working out in the community, very, very close and within people's homes. They, they often have a different experience, uh, as, as well sometimes equally challenging. So it's really important we offer that equity of access. With continuity of carer, uh, which of course is the national plan moving forward when we have sufficient staffing to do it safely, um, we have to ensure that our new midwives coming in have appropriate preceptorship. So this is um, appropriate uh, transition. So for when you, when you <laughs> transition, and I'm sure those of us that have been qualified for a very long time will still remember, um, when you move from being a student into actually being a registrant, that, that jump is absolutely huge. You're moving from being somebody that's supernumerary, that doesn't hold accountability and responsibility for, for the patients in your care, to, to actually being the person that's responsible. Um, so we, we offer now extended preceptorship for our newly qualified midwives who are working both in the community and in the hospital setting so they have that opportunity for additional education and consolidate the experience they've gained through their, their training. We also have a retention midwife at ESNEFT. Uh, we have a variety of different uh, uh, processes in place. We, we're also um, accessing legacy roles now. Uh, so these are, these are some of our midwives who have retired but actually want to come back in a different way. They still want to uh, support the new workforce coming through. And the way that we've done that is we've, we've absolutely relaxed our contracts of employment. So historically, you used to have to do a set number of hours per week uh, to be able to have a contract. We've eradicated that at ESNEFT. 
so that if you want to come every other week on a Tuesday and provide some clinical supervision and support because that works for your life, uh, then that's, that's what we do at ESNEF. So we are supporting people to be able to return and, and still contribute uh, within the health and care system. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm really pleased to hear that seems like an excellent programme. Um, Mel, would you like to add anything on, on, on this subject? No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question, um, Councillor. Um, Councillor Marks. Um, yes, I, just for uh, Councillor, sorry, you didn't actually answer the question on the ultrasound. I think you asked about ultrasound, didn't you? The question regarding ex extra ultrasounds. I just noticed that wasn't answered. I don't know if that wanted to be answered first. I, I mean, if I may, um, uh, it, it will be something that we would have to go away from. I'm not aware of national guidance that has demanded an increase in ultrasonography. Um, that would be managed through, obviously, our obstetric workforce, and we, we can obviously pick that up and come back through to committee once I've had confirmation, but that's not, not something I think either Justina or I are, are aware of. Thank you. Thank you. Go uh, ahead, um, Thank Marks. you. So if I may, um, three very quick questions. I noticed you began your uh, conversation, Dr Thorpe, with saying that your recruitment levels are now sound and you're fully recruited. And then we move on to Justina, who says there's our challenge. I just wondered why there is a disparity between the two. And obviously, hopefully, you work together so that if you've got too many people coming to you, you share them with West Suffolk. But so so uh, my first question will be why the disparity and um, because that sounded quite dramatically different. Uh, my second question, please. Uh, very early on, when we first became aware of the concerns in maternity, was the fact you were bringing community nurses who were untrained in acute services in to manage your acute settings. And that was how we picked up a lot of the concerns. The nurses were coming to us and saying they were very worried that they were being taken from the community and put into an acute setting when they weren't qualified in acute and they were terrified. So I just wondered how you've managed that element, please. And, and thirdly, one of the things I see in the community a lot is the breakdown of family units, which means that I feel very much that you're picking up a lot of the work that may have been picked up by mothers and grandmothers in supporting people after they've had their children, they've had their babies, when they go home in feeding issues, um, bathing and all these sort of things. And, and you know that's obviously added to your workload because that, that's something you must be picking up. It can't have been avoided. But I just wonder whether you do anything in getting recruiting volunteer birthing support partners. So people in the community who want to volunteer, you know, people who've been grandmothers, because they, their children might have moved away, but they still have a lot to offer uh, that may take some, some of the pressure off of your services. So they're, they're my three questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Poshet, where do you want to start? Um, Charles, do you want to start and we'll move uh, along? If I may, and, and thank you for, for the questions, Councillor Marks. Um, I, I'm only able to speak for, uh, on ESNEF's behalf, and it would be inappropriate for me to speak on behalf of West Suffolk, and it's, it's great that Karen's here now. But we absolutely had an acute uh, issue in relation to our vacancies uh, for, for the past two years. And I think, I think when you look at the demographics of our workforce, we recognise that there were a significant number of midwives that were reaching their retirement age. Uh, if I'm completely honest, I think um, I think the COVID pandemic had had a huge impact on the workforce at Esneft, and 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 some of our staff made the decision actually that they didn't want to work in that environment and made the decision, and they had the opportunity to retire early. Um, we undertook a, a significant piece of work in, in relation to recruitment. We, we also did access international recruitment, although not to the numbers that um, they've successfully recruited to at West Suffolk, because I think our pipeline uh, with our students uh, coming through both in the North East Essex space and the Ipswich space um, allowed us that opportunity to be able to recruit at pace with, with those cohorts who uh, agreed upon completion of their, their studentship that they wish to continue working. I think the benefits that we also do have at ESNEFT, we are a multi-site uh, organisation which gives an opportunity for people to move from Ipswich to Colchester and vice versa. Um, so therefore people, if they are able to make life choices in terms of where they live, then, that, then it's far easier for them to, to move to another site. Um, uh, so I think, I think the, the, 
the acute position of our problem two years ago, really focused our attention on, on moving that forward. And, and we're, we're in a very fortunate position to uh, be moving to a zero vacancy factor in, in the next couple of months. However, we will not rest on our laurels. We do understand the future demographic of our workforce. And I think that ties also back into the place of the legacy role so we don't lose the experience, that we don't end with a very, very junior workforce. So it will be something that we, we absolutely continue to focus on. But thank you for the question. Thank you. Um, would anyone know? Um, Karen, welcome. And um, I think um, we, we've had, you probably have picked up what this question is, is really about. about if, if you'd like to comment, please do. So we can do regarding the staffing, yes. So um, I think the complicated thing with the West Suffolk is with it when we look at the staffing, it's um, we have been very lucky that the board actually supported us going 100% cons duty of carer, and with that, that increased our establishment for our midwives. But that was to enable that to happen. So when we look at our staffing, that's because. The deficit is from 100% continuity of carer. So that's why it looks like we've got so few of midwives. But if you will look at what we need to actually cover the service without continuity of carer, the deficit is not so much. However, the grand scheme is obviously to go towards continuity of carer. Yes, I think Giles is absolutely right. COVID did not particularly help. I think people absolutely looked at their work-life balance. So we have exactly the same number of people if not more, but actually they've reduced their hours. So actually, if you look at it from a whole time equivalent point of view, we've got less. Um, we also, continuity care was for some people not the way that they wanted to work. And actually, I think, again, with COVID, with people being at that particular moment in their life, thinking of retirement, that was the choice they therefore made. So that's why we did have a, a bit quite a significant drop, probably in about 2020. Uh, and then we have been steadily trying to get more and more people. I think, again, with COVID, people weren't looking at moving other areas. Um, and so, but now we are definitely seeing an uptake. Where if you'd asked me this time last year, I'd be saying that band six midwives, so they're your experienced midwives are like hen's teeth. We're now seeing more and more band sixes wanting to move and we're actually seeing them coming through our recruitment process, which is fantastic. But it also does mean that we have got a very junior workforce because up until that point, we could only recruit newly qualified midwives. Um, and with the more senior ones leaving, that does leave a, the, you know, our, those issues. So we're having to support people with increased practice development midwives, but also with practice facilitator midwives. We've increased our legacy midwives. But then that means that those experienced people who would be working on the shop floor are now in those more specialist roles, which then makes more of a deficit in your actual midwives that you've got working. But, you know, it, as, um, as Giles says, you know, we, we do have massive plans and we will get there. It's just that we've, we've got a bit of a trajectory at the moment. And, and also with the international recruits, which Justina has worked brilliantly on. Yes, they are midwives, but they're not midwives in this country. So if there are elements particularly around consent, um, but also about the fetal monitoring, the electronic fetal monitoring that they have particularly some countries haven't actually had. So again, we're having to do quite a lot of training. So yes, we've got those midwives, but we can't say that they're fully in our numbers as such until they've completed that. Great. Thank you very much. Um, would anyone else like to come in? I'm, I'm anxious to make sure that everyone has a chance to, um, to ask their questions. Um, would anyone, uh, any other panel members like to add anything? Lisa, would you? Or? Councillor Marks, could you, uh, sorry, your, your question about um, the involving grandmothers and could you just repeat yeah, that for me, you, sorry? You yeah. has impacted quite heavily yeah. on your workload yeah. and I'm wondering whether there is a way back a little bit from that by you know volunteers are becoming very uh, de rigueur state of the art now of involving um, grandparents you know people who, um, I think I used the word birthing support partners and you yeah. know post delivery support partners so 
I'm sure there would be a lot of mothers and grandmothers. I mean, we, my husband and I did it for 22 years with people, so I know there are people out there who would do that. And I feel it's very sad that these people don't have the support in the community. Yeah. You're not always at hand. And, it, and I feel you've picked up a lot of work yeah. because of what's happened, really, in, in community breakdowns. And I just wonder whether you've even considered using uh, you know, other sort of support services to pick up some of that work to reduce your workload. So, so I, I, I'm, I'm sure colleagues might want to, uh, to answer further, but certainly in the areas that we are working with specific communities, that's something that we focus on. So the African families in UK, actually we meet with the grandmothers uh, we, we, because we've found that if we meet with the grandmothers, they educate, that, that they are the people that um, our pregnant people go to for advice and support. So we, we do a lot of work with the grandmothers and we do, going back to the, the kind of Romani coordinators, actually building that knowledge within the community educating people on pregnancy is something that needs to happen across the community because they will they listen to their neighbors they listen to their families they listen to their their parents and you know the the, the shop owners and people much more than they listen to professionals mm -hmm. so that really intensive work that's why we are working really closely with those communities so that we don't just educate the families, we are educating the whole community. I don't know if there's any specific volunteers that you use to support women. I don't know, Giles. Uh, so, so completely picking up on what, what Lisa says, and I, I understand, Councillor, from a community perspective, I think where we, where we look at things from a trust perspective, we do have volunteers in terms of, um, so of course we have our infant feeding specialist midwives, um, who absolutely do that that's their job that's what they do in terms of supporting within the hospital setting of course for for some of our families our babies then do move into neonatal care uh, and of course we do actually have volunteers who are working in the neonatal setting in terms of support because of course the psychological impact for for those families of you know they're, they're not going home with baby babies are obviously in a neonatal unit so um, we do have volunteers from from that perspective um, but I think it I think it is Im important that we do utilize the voluntary and community support sector for the wider community piece and I think you're absolutely right it's great that we do that with specific um, subgroups of our populations but I think there's absolutely more more work that, that we can be doing and of course we do signpost from the hospital out to to community groups for for further support but there's always more work to do if, if I just may in terms of the question around community nurses being brought into acute mm -hmm. setting can I could I just clarify are you talking about community midwives coming into oh, the yes, hospital yes, community midwives, sorry. so yeah. um, in terms of certainly for us, and I'm, I'm sure Karen or Justine will mention about West Suffolk, so our, our, our midwives are trained to either work in the community or in the acute setting. It is not that they are trained differently or have different skill sets. Of course, it, it, whilst uh, our midwives may well be based within the community setting, of course, they, they still are able to come into the hospital. Now, now where during COVID, and we obviously had staff who were, who were sick, which meant that we didn't have sufficient safe staffing of midwives, it did mean that actually we had to um, coalesce our services within the hospital setting. We couldn't, we couldn't run community and hospital maternity services because, of course, we had our own staff who were sick with COVID. That did mean that we were moving our community teams into the hospital setting, but I would like to assure council members that our staff are completely trained to work in any setting at any point. Uh, and of course, with the continuity of carer model that, that's being rolled forward, that will mean that we will see greater fluidity of our staff, both working within and out into the community setting. Thank you. I hope that's helpful. Sorry, can I just come in on that point? Um, only because I used to be a community midwife before I um, did this role. And so actually, the majority of the work in the whole of the maternity is actually done in the community. So if you think about all of the pregnancy, so right from day one, and some people know they're pregnant now from three weeks, all the way up until when they have their baby. We're also supporting people with home births in the community. 
and then also that postnatal period. Now, yes, the majority of people, it's up until 10 days, but sometimes it can go up to 28 days as well. So actually, the majority of the work is actually regarding the whole of the maternity journey is actually done in the community. It's only really the birth, which, you know, I know that's the bit that most people think of that's done in hospital. So we at the West Suffolk, because we've always wanted to go over to continuity care, but actually we really want to make sure that we keep our midwives as skilled as possible. We have always integrated the two services. So yes, the midwives do work in the community, but they also do some shifts in the hospital because one, we want to enable them to feel kind of when they go to home births that they're very well supported but also you know it's about everyone working as, a, as one big team but it is a definite it's a definite different skill set because um, it's very much about your screening process the whole of the antenatal the postnatal and also home births as well so yes but but there is a kind of there is a, a workforce um, that they, they do they, they are integrated and when it comes to um, volunteer services we don't have that many volunteer services, I'm being really honest in the West. Uh, we do rely on things like Home Start for those supporting people um, who need to have that little bit more extra support, but there, there isn't. I know it's something that we are definitely working with the LMNS to look at actually having more volunteer support, um, but Justine will be able to talk to you just a bit about the um, infant feeding support that we've got. Justine, if you could have a quick word, and then I need to move through the other councillors' questions. Thank you. So we've had a very well-established volunteer sector to provide uh, breastfeeding support on our post mainly on postnatal ward before uh, the COVID, and then ha that had to be stopped uh, during the COVID. And we are now in a position when uh, ha um, we've had uh, reintroducing the service because it's got uh, a lot of benefits for mum and staff um, as well. So we are uh, now um, our infant feeding coordinator is working very closely with the volunteer sector in providing the training for them. So then they will be able to be on the ward working uh, independently. So we've got a small group that have undertaken mm -hmm. that training and is able to provide that support. And then we've got a two that is uh, still undergoing the training to, to be able to undertake that. So that will be really quite good support for both, for mum, staff, as well as for volunteers, because I think they enjoy coming in and providing that support as well. Thank you. Thank, thank you all very much. Um, I'll move on now to Councillor Lockington. You have uh, questions. Th thank you, Chair. Um, I just wondered, in the report, and it was touched on, it's the nitrous oxide, and it was mentioned that nobody suffered, you know, no, you know, how do you actually know that? Because <laughs> it's so easy to, for us to say, because I wasn't the mum giving birth at that time. So, you know, how, how do we know that nobody suffered? And also, I, I just wonder, for example, with different groups of people. Um, what about people that's had female, female circumcision? Because I know that childbirth can be really difficult for people. So are you always able to pick that up? We may not have a lot in Suffolk, but there may be people. So these are the things which are really important to, to pick up on. Um, and also, uh, Lisa Noobs, you mentioned mental health you know, because we need to be sure that if somebody already has a mental health problem, you know, getting a child that's, you know, or if you have addiction, you know, how do you work with parents with addiction? Because unless they sadly, some of them lose their child taken away because of their addiction, but if not, a child that are come out and are addicted, the cry from an addicted baby can be the worst cry I, I'm told that you could ever hear in life. So there are things, you know, like that. But I know hospitals now are keen to make leaflets about everything. Could I just ask that somebody go and reread the leaflet when it's about disposal of remains from your pregnancy? If what you give out in the leaflet is what you have on your website, please just have a good read at that and change some wording there because that, you know, is not the best text, I think. So, uh, but these are my questions. I should stop here and then if there's more time, we might come back later. Okay, thank, thank you um, very much. Um, Giles, will you go ahead? 
Yes, th thank you, Chair. Um, so, thank you, Councillor Lockington, as always. Um, uh, so, in relation to nitrous oxide, if I'd just like to clarify, the issue around nitrous oxide is the cumulative exposure to nitrous oxide. So, I'd like to reassure uh, council members that for a pregnant person who is giving birth, they are not receiving excessive amounts of nitrous oxide. The, the risk is always to the staff because they are going in and out of the room. So if there is insufficient ventilation, nitrous oxide particles will continue to uh, remain within the atmosphere. Nitrous oxide is a very heavy, I know an awful lot about nitrous oxide, might I just say. Um, <laughs> nitrous oxide is a very heavy gas, so it actually falls to the floor. So you have to have specific scavenger units to be able to extract nitrous oxide from the atmosphere. The way that we know that our staff have not been negatively affected is there are specific blood tests which are undertaken. Uh, these have been managed by our occupational health department and the occupational health team have assured me that the levels which have come back do not evidence that any staff member has been negatively affected. We have learnt a lot from the organisations which have been in the media uh, for a protracted period of time. Uh, we took those lessons learned and we ensured at ESNEFT we acted quickly, we acted appropriately, we put in the ventilation and we ensured that our staff were fully supported. So I can guarantee you our staff are fine. Could I just quickly say, what about the mothers giving birth? The, as, as I've previously said, Councillor Lockington, during birth, that is not an excessive amount of nitrous oxide. They leave the delivery suite and they leave the delivery room. So therefore, they are not exposed for a protracted period of time. And, that, and that's from the scientific I, evidence. I fully understand mm. that. I was thinking about the pain control for mothers because... Oh, yeah. Uh, so, so, of course, we did inform all of the pregnant people when we didn't have um, uh, nitrous oxide available. There are other pain methodologies that are utilised and offered to women. However, of course, it is a woman's choice if she wishes to have nitrous oxide that we had good communication with those women who wished to move to another delivery unit and ensured that we liaised with those, with those other uh, units so that they have the appropriate paperwork um, we wanted to ensure that pregnant people didn't just arrive at another unit in, in the service because, of course, there's a lot of information that, that follows a person when they're getting ready to give birth. And we had to ensure that that information, uh, particularly for our colleagues at West Suffolk, um, uh, that the, they had the information that they needed so that pregnancy and that delivery could go ahead safely. Okay. Um, is there anyone would like to add anything before we move on? Just if I could answer the question of regarding the um, female, female genital mutilation. So we, we do have people who have that. And most women, once they're pregnant, they're obviously extremely worried about it. So they do engage quite quickly and they do actually tell us that that's what um, that they have. But we actually, that's just an automatic question that we ask every single person on us booking them. Um, and then they will be in a specific clinic. So whether it's whether they have to have any uh, corrective surgery prior to the birth or whether it's mode of delivery might be looked at differently. But it's very much working with that individual person. Um, and just that working in areas where they previously, where there are higher area, um, cases of um, FGM, it's very much about you know, making sure you document even if a birth of a baby as female what the genitalia is like so actually you can keep a very clear kind of documentation of that so you know there is absolutely it's always very on the forefront of all of our minds um, to make sure that we are inquiring about it but we're also supporting people through that and when it comes to supporting vulnerable families we do have uh, they will always come under our safeguarding midwife because often there's lots of safeguarding with that in the ideal world they would be under continuity of carer but that's not always uh, possible but it's very much working with that whole family not just the mum or pregnant person it's working with that whole family and supporting them the whole way through the journey and if the case is that that baby is removed is then making sure that they then have that support afterwards because any person losing a child whether it's through whatever reason, it's a massive loss and actually they need lots of support. Um, and so we do enable, we do uh, refer them onto a, a separate surface to support them there as well, yeah. And if I can just, going back to the leaflets, just really quickly, 
what we do do is we try to make sure all of our service users are involved in every single leaflet. If I could get rid of every leaflet, I would do, because I don't think people read them. But if we, if we absolutely have service users look at all of our leaflets, and in particular any ones regarding loss, the SANS um, volunteer group are very good at making sure that we've worded things right. So if we have ever done anything that people think, oh, do you know what's really upsetting, then we are very quick to change things. So um, we can always look at if, um, we can always look at our um, leaflets on that front. Thank you. Thank you. Very, yes. Uh, and, and if I may, Councillor Lockington, in, in relation to that specific leaflet, that's due for review in May. Of course, we will work with our MMVP and our patient panel uh, in, in, in relation so that we ensure that we've got service user feedback on the language utilised in, in the leaflet. Uh, and in relation to our more vulnerable uh, pregnant people and families, we actually have a vulnerabilities team at Ipswich. Whilst we're not in the enviable position of rolling out continuity of care at the current time, uh, we have got specific teams that will wrap around those more vulnerable families to ensure that they are supported antenatally during birth and postnatally. So it is continuity light is, is the way that I would ex explain it. Thank you. Um, move on now to um, Councillor Shaw. Questions? Thank you. Um, I just want to acknowledge the importance of um, good care all around um, maternity. Um, just a sort of quick anecdotal thing. My daughter's um, pregnancy first one was during COVID. The experience was not good, um, of course. Um, her second one, she's in her third trimester now, is so different. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that uh, pe I think people have learned from that. And I'd be interested to know um, how much you have learned from that COVID experience of what, what that's fed into. Um, so that's my first question. I do have something else, if, if that's OK, fairly quickly. Um, this is about the um, equality of opportunity. And I think you have mentioned this, but it was quite alarming to read the MPs um, report yesterday, I think it was reported on BBC News, that um, people from black ethnic minority, for example, are something like four times more likely to die within six weeks of giving birth. And is that sort of thing that's reflected in our region here, or is that uh, you know, sort, of, sort of an average figure given? I'd be very interested in that. And I think you know, my colleague here has mentioned the, obviously, the particular communities, um, how much um, how successful is your communication with those communities? I think you have referred a little bit, but if there's any more to add, I'd like to hear that now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Giles, will you go ahead? <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, there is so much learning that's come from COVID. Um, it, it's, it, it's an unprecedented event that has affected health and care services across the country. I'm, I'm really sorry that your daughter had a poor experience during, during um, uh, their, their, their first birth. There is an awful lot that we now understand um, uh, around how we improve our communication, how we support family members to be able to attend uh, a hospital, uh, recognising that people are able to undertake their own risk assessments. But I think during particularly the first and second waves of COVID, I think our, our fear was palpable uh, in that we either did not want to introduce COVID from the community, nor did we wish to uh, introduce COVID to the community by, by um, not restricting as much as we possibly could do. Birth is meant to be a joyous event and birth under stress is not a joyous event by any stretch of the imagination. And I think not all, only for the families, I'm sure, who under, uh, were distressed, I think also for our staff, the moral distress that they had by not being able to provide the level of care that they wish to, um, I think continues to have an impact on, on, on our workforce, if I'm honest. But, you know, we've, we've learned a lot. We've understood how we can do things differently. Our utilisation of technology has improved dramatically. Um, and I think um, having those conversations early on uh, I, I think is really important. We are better prepared should anything else come. And I, you know, I touch wood now that nothing does. Um, but I think, I think we are more, more, more cautious of those early warning signs that we, that we can put the right things in place to ensure that that family has the best possible experience irrespective of what is going on around. Uh, and I think that will always continue to remain our focus if, if, if 
if that's uh, uh, an answer for you. I may well hand over to Lisa around the or Karen if Karen wants to come in and then Lisa. Thank you. Um, yes, and you know, again, as Giles said, I'm sorry that your daughter had that experience. And I think it, you know, I'm not going to lie, it was a really tough time for everybody. Staff were scared to be at work. Um, and um, and, it, and that, was, that was a very difficult thing to do. But the one thing that we did our absolute utmost was to try and make sure that we didn't stop birthing partners from being there with people when they were in labour. Um, and also trying to make any experience that we possibly could the best we could with what we had at the time. Um, and so even if it was things like we did uh, live uh, Facebook chats with people so we could get the knowledge out to them uh, because they weren't able to have antenatal classes or they felt they weren't seeing anybody, we tried to do as much as we possibly could with what we had at the time, I think. Um, and yes, there's been lots of lessons learn from it and I think there's been some really great things that have come out from it but I think there's also some things that we need to now go back which is a little bit difficult so really get that real kind of human back face to face kind of things um, but with that we also need the support from our uh, communities as well to enable us back in the community to enable us to do those face to faces. Um, you said about the equality, so we do any incident, we do look at kind of the demographics of that person, whether it's their postcode or their ethnicity, and I can absolutely say that we do not see that um, in the West Suffolk. Um, but we have, I think, again, COVID really highlighted to us how people from black, Asian, ethnic minorities were actually more at risk. So we all, we'd already put a plan in place to kind of uh, offer more care or have a very lower threshold for seeing somebody and especially also in the postnatal period so um you know potentially that's what that has that's why it's been but it's something that we absolutely do monitor yes thank you if i could just add on that because actually um although we we don't see increased uh, mortality either from maternal or from neonates in in bane backgrounds what we what we have seen and we've been doing a lot of work on is that sometimes the care hasn't been culturally appropriate, which is a really massive thing for, for people. So, um, and it goes back to what Mel was saying about personalized care. And when we've spoken to our maternity workforce, there is some, it's sometimes really challenging for they feel very challenged in having that conversation with people around, you know, background, ethnicity. So we've released 12 films across the LMNSB called It's OK to Ask, which are communities, not, not just from ethnic, different ethnic backgrounds, but we've actually got um, a lady with autism that is encouraging our maternity workforce and saying it's okay to ask me about how I, how I want to experience my childbirth. It's okay to mention my autism. It's okay to talk about my different cultural background and trying to have a more open and honest conversation where, um, I mean, famously on the video, you will see the, the black lady saying, I know I'm black. You can mention that I'm black, actually. It's not a problem. It's okay to ask me how in Africa, how, you know, where my heritage is from, how, that, how my pregnancy and childbirth would be. So I think although we haven't seen patient safety issues, there is work that we need to still do to make sure that it's culturally appropriate. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I was wondering, um, Mel, um, would you like to comment on, on any of the questions? Please do indicate or raise your hands because um, because you're not here doesn't mean to say that you know you're um, peripheral at all. So please do comment. Thank you. Um, I mean, a lot of the comments uh, and questions are uh, been around internally within the within the hospital setting. Obviously, the MVP works predominantly on gathering service user feedback, but I think. In this particular area, it's worth noting that, yes, that is a, an area of focus to make sure that, that we do gather the voices of um, minority groups. So we do work more extensively now, um, as Lisa was saying, and with the LMNS, on making sure that we are actively out in those communities asking for that feedback. So another example is the MVP are working with a, a charity in Ipswich called the Phoebe Charity, specifically wanting to work with their maternity advocate on gathering feedback 
of um, black, the black population with, who works within their community. So it is something that's definitely a focus for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think, does that sort of respond to your queries, Councillor? Um, yes, thanks very much. And I'm, I'm really pleased that you are doing work in this area. Um, and I think it would be useful to have some update on how that's going. And particularly interested in this, it's okay to ask, where do we find that? Um, I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, Mel, Mel's probably better to answer, answer that. I'm sure the MVP... Um, Facebook pages and everything has it, but probably on our LMNSB page, but I can find the link. On YouTube. On YouTube, sorry. And on YouTube. YouTube. Okay. And YouTube. Okay. I don't you. use YouTube, so I'm not very good on that. But. Great, thank, thank you. Um, move on. Councillor Beck, do you have a question? Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, yeah, there was just one question I had. Uh, you mentioned um, the, sort of, um, uh, the, the, the relatively high percentage of uh, female smokers who continue to smoke during pregnancy, uh, what support, if any, are, are, are they given to, to actually quit? Um, because I am aware, having been an ex-smoker um, uh, myself, that I tried many ways of quitting, uh, medication, patches, sprays, etc. Nothing worked until I discovered vapes. And I quit overnight, pretty much. Um, and I, I, I've noticed the health benefits in the last nine, ten months significant benefits um, but I'm just uh, I, I am aware that I think um, I read a report that um, the NHS now regards um, vaping as the number one tool to get people to quit smoking tobacco um, if that is the case um, then are um, pregnant women offered vapes as a substitute to try and wean them off tobacco thank you thank you and congratulations for, <laughs> for stopping smoking so um, Stopping smoking is one of the most important public health things we can support women and their household members to, to, to stop doing. The, if one of my midwives was here, the epigenetics of smoking, actually, it changes, um, the midwives know it much better than I do, but it, it actually changes the DNA of babies and has a significant impact on on the likelihood of them having neurodiversity and, and various other conditions. So it is really, really important. Um, we've had a, maybe a more historic way of um, working just with the woman, which as I said, we've now extended that out to the family, but certainly giving access to any nicotine replacement, whether they want patches or vapes, is part, of the, is part of the process. And coaching, I mean coaching, and explaining, and it all go, we, all, we will all keep coming back to continuity of carer, because we're so passionate about continuity of carer, because if you have a, a small team of midwives that's with you through that whole pathway who are constantly reinforcing the message that are constantly saying you know how's it going how are you doing you know you're week four how is it then that make that makes a huge difference but we've invested quite a bit of money into smoking cessation and we're seeing some really great outcomes and we're really looking forward um, to our first smoke-free pregnancies and, and delivery sorry our first smoke-free babies which should be the end of the year, which are born to women that um, our teams have helped to stop smoking. So that's really, we've just got to make sure that they don't go back to it. That's, and that's the what we're doing with early years in the health visiting team. How do we keep that approach going so that when we all know how, how difficult it can be in the early years of childhood as a parent, so how do you, how do you not relapse back into smoking? Sorry, we're very passionate. Great. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. I, I think that probably goes for um, alcohol and drug use as well, because um, those obviously have a profound effect on the outcome of the child. And um, I'm sure there's a lot of work going on in that area. But um, um, I'll move on now to um, <coughs> Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Chair. Um, if I may make a couple of observations. A, I'd like to express my disappointment being from the north of the area, the James Padgett is not represented today. And the other observation is, I think that would be better to have you back when you're all in the middle, or just had, of CQC inspections. And we're going to be able to make a lot more sense of things when we've seen the reports. So I 
can't help but think we need to see you again when they're all done and dusted. My other question is, there is councillors here far more, infinitely more qualified to me than me to ask questions about maternity treatment, etc., etc. But I, I wish to know, what do you think we can do to help? Is there anything, do we have a role anywhere in this to assist? Thank, thank you. Um, firstly, I'm, I'm, I agree around James Paget. Unfortunately, that's our Norfolk and Waveney ICB colleagues that oversee James Paget, so um, I'm not able to comment on that. With regards to CQC, I genuinely do not believe that the CQC will tell you anything different to what we're telling you. I think we know and we understand maternity services really well. We, we are constantly visiting. We have... Um, more scrutiny of maternity than any other of our, I would say, our clinical services. And um, we actually had recently a rapid quality review with ESNEFT because there were some things that we wanted to talk about as a system. Yeah, and um, again, there is, you know, we, we operate in a very open and transparent way. And I, I really very much doubt that CQC will find anything that we are not already aware of. Um, that's the second point. Uh, gosh, sorry, I'm sorry, I can't remember your last question. Anything they can do to help. Oh, yes. So, sorry, thank you. So, we recently met with the voluntary sector that work with our communities in maternity, and we were asking them, what are what are women telling you? What are communities telling you? And the the one thing that came out from those groups that they would they raise as a real root cause of their problems is housing. So, and I, I, and I don't know whether you can help with that, but um, housing creates our pregnant people and their families significant worries, whether it is overcrowding, whether it is um, for pregnant people that are, do not have their own houses and they're sofa surfing. When we look back at a number of our deaths that happen through our child death review process that happen in infancy, it is frequently due to young, younger mothers who are sleeping on people's sofas and co-sleeping with their children or in overcrowded housing. So... The one thing that we are yet to find a way to, as an LMNSB, is, is housing and transport, Councillor Robinson, transport. Transport into our acute hospitals is very expensive when you've got um, small children and you have to frequently go, particularly if you're a high-risk woman, into, into acute services, and, and that's what they worry about, that uh, health can't resolve. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm aware, Mel, that you have limited time. Um, would you like to comment on this or um, leave us any, any, um, any of your thoughts before you leave? I'm afraid so. I do need to leave at 11.30. Um, I, I wondered whether anyone had any specific comments actually for me on service user feedback or what we're hearing or wanted to have a discussion about any of those points that I raised in terms of where we do hear most of the feedback. Um, specifically around place of birth, induction of labour, birth choices, feeling in control of decisions you make about labour of birth um, just before I depart. So I don't have anything to add, but wondered whether anyone wanted to ask me anything from a maternity voices partnership perspective before I leave. Thank, thank you. I'm not sure, in honours, I heard the last comment very clearly. Um. Not really, but um, I, I would really like to thank you for coming. And, um, you know, I'd like if we meet again on this subject, um, I would very much like you to participate and to, um, to hear the views of you and the group you work with. And thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you. Um, sorry, Andy would like to add something. Before Mel left, um, I have a question uh, really to the, to the guests, but also to Mel specifically. Um, something I've noted is, does Mel feel and do the MVPs feel that uh, they, 
there's a very obvious and clear, you said we've, we, we did response from commissioners and from the hospitals and from community teams when the um, maternity voices partnerships raise anything, uh, either the, in, in the congratulatory terms or uh, with concerns. Um, and I would ask the same of the system in response to anything that Health Watch Suffolk raises uh, and has raised in the past, as we have more recently uh, in support of the Health Watch England work. Um, I think something more obvious in terms of you said we did would be really, really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, would any of the panel like to respond? Um, in terms of how, how do you use the information that Maternity Voices provides? Um, thank you. So anything that either Maternity Voice um, Partnership provides or Health Watch, we then obviously um, we discuss, we have action plans and then we share that information back so one of the examples was regarding our antenatal uh, provision of um, kind of education so again that was uh, the MVP uh, did the massive survey of women saying that it wasn't really consistent across the whole of the West patch um, so we looked at it we tried to uniform it we then went back to the um, MVP and said right is this you know, can you then go back out now, please, to the service users and see if we've now managed to capture it right? Obviously, we're doing our own um, our own kinds of feedback, but we, we absolutely did that. In COVID, when we partners weren't feeling like they were being included, that was the feedback that we were getting. So again, that's why we put on the weekly uh, Facebook live chat so we could actually include partners in that front. Um, I have to say, during COVID, the MVP were amazing at forwarding all of the really positive uh, feedback that they were getting so we could then kind of tell the, our staff this is what feedback you're getting so we do have this to and, to and fro quite a lot uh, but we also do have a very good relationship with our maternity and neonate voice partnership um, and we have our regular meetings which and again we invite them to come to us we have our 15 steps which is due in the west um, very soon where they can have a look at every area and again the feedback that they give us is such quality feedback that it's something that we can really work in um, and from the last 15 steps there's just a couple of things that we weren't able to do because of covid and that's because we physically couldn't get off-site work people into the trust which we have now all completed so that is brilliant that is really good no that's really good um giles uh, thank you chair I, th I think very similarly to uh west suffolk i think we have a very strong working relationship with the nm uh, uh, M MNVP. Um, uh, one of the things that we certainly did was, um, as part of our every day, every uh, every birth, every day program board, uh, we ensured that the MNVP were invited to provide feedback to the wider stakeholder group, and we also invite the MNVP to our safety champions update on a monthly basis. Now, recognising, of course, and being mindful of the fact. Uh, that uh, our MVP, MMVP chairs are, are working and also have children, we're actually changing the dates because we recognise that that wasn't, wasn't convenient. Uh, so we're actually moving the dates of our meetings so that they are so that we can ensure that there is regular attendance. Uh, so, so that's certainly something we did. They've attended our 15, uh, our 15 steps, which has been great. Uh, and also we've had two of those 15 steps programmes and seen a positive uh, improvement in services uh, in one of our wards in particular, which has been really positive to see. Uh, so, so I think, I, I'm, I'm sure Mel may want to comment on it, but I think we've certainly improved the working relationship over the last two years, and, and over COVID it's been invaluable. Good, that's very positive. Thank you very much, and, and thank you again, Mel. Um, I'll move on now. Um, Councillor Richards. Thank you, Chair. All right, so Justina did mention that uh, West Suffolk has, got, uh, has had a problem with, with the stillbirth rate. We're talking about comparative with other trusts. Uh, but I, um, because I live in Ipswich and I'm partisan and I'm a Ipswich uh, county councillor, I'm more interested in, in Ipswich and it's a shame that Nick Hume isn't here to answer my questions. Um, so I'd like to know how the uh, stillbirth, neonatal death and uh, perinatal death rates are going are, are they improving how do they compare with west suffolk can you because you've obviously put in a lot of uh, of um what would you call them interventions to improve maternity services and i wondered how things were going thank you 
Can I just clarify, it was pre-10 birth, not a stillbirth, that was SAPEC uh, was um, uh, obviously looking into reducing. Uh, thank you, Councillor Richards. Um, obviously, some of the information that's shared at the EBED is an internal meeting, and therefore I wouldn't be sharing that in a public format. But what I can say in relation to our neonatal death rate is that we continue with our improvement work. Uh, obviously, any, any neonatal death or intrauterine death, which of course is a very, very sad event, but does happen within maternity services, is fully investigated in line with the national standards and protocols. But of course, further information will go through the internal meeting at EBED, of course, which you're, you're, you're a member of but I, I can't share that information obviously in a public setting can I ask what direction it's going in please it's going in a positive direction councillor good thank you um, sorry can I just come in um, so just as Justina said our stillbirth rate has not been we're not seen as an outlier at the West Suffolk for our stillbirth rates we absolutely are within what they would expect a unit of our size to be and um, but just the, as a whole country obviously the um, ambition is to halve the numbers of stillbirths and as a whole country we are all on the right trajectory to do that so that is fantastic but with that is it's what we have done is that it's not just about working as a, as a silo in maternity, it's very much working with our neonatal service, so that's why in the West we've absolutely brought the neonatal service along with us now, and we co-produce everything along with our NMVP, um, and so that is our, still our very strong ambition, but one of the biggest ones is going to be to reduce the number of smokers, so yeah, thank you. Thank you, and obviously my role is to um, ensure that across Suffolk we are sharing good best practice and we are ensuring that the great things that West Suffolk does or Ipswich does is being replicated. So we have a maternity system wide improvement piece of work around postpartum hemorrhage, for example, and around triage. So actually when a woman or, or pregnant person uh, presents into hospital, how are we understanding the risk of that person and making sure that they get the right response and that's, that's work that we're doing and some great work that's happened in West Suffolk around risk assessment, Ipswich are now taking on. So it's, it's really important that we're doing that work but absolutely I think sometimes there is a perception that preterm deaths are always the fault of the maternity services and, and they're not always the the risk factors as we've said around addiction smoking and and, and lots of other risk factors are are prevalent there but that's that's kind of my job really in the system on the preconception pathway the public health work and to to make sure that people are as fit and healthy as possible before they get pregnant thank you Thank you all. Thank you all very much. Um, any more questions, Councillor? Yeah. Um, last but not least, Councillor Mabry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman, and um, thank you to the panel um, uh, that are here today. Um, I have a variety, a couple of comments, and also some questions. And I'm last, so I'm sure Chairman will tell me to stop if, <laughs> if I need to. Um, first of all. A strange question, I know, but you're talking about trying to keep midwives, um, and you've been talking about training. Who actually pays for the training? That's my first question, and there's a reason why I ask. Um, do you go ahead and answer. For uh, we do. <laughs> we pay for the training. Right. Thank you, because I know that uh, um, that it's not always the same over all disciplines um, within the NHS. So thank you for that. Um, the second um, item was, um, I, I'm sure it was Justina was talking about, that um, midwives used to get free meals as an incentive, and now that's stopped. Um, I, I would like nice. to know why, because I, I find that really poor show. 
So that was offered uh, by a trust overnight for staff who were coming to work overnight to support them, uh, for example, if they weren't in a position to get that meal, because during the day the canteens and the shop were open in the trust and at night they both are closed. Um, and also it was in a time in the COVID when sometimes they potentially weren't in a position to go to the shops because the shops were all also working within limited uh, hours when it was offered. It was paid by the trust uh, uh, to support that intensive and it has been now obviously replaced slightly different, although we're not providing any uh, meals overnight, but we do provide the breakfast for staff in the canteen to support with the cost of living. Right, thank you. Um, now I understand. I, I, I think I've missed a few words, and that's my issue from the panel and, and not yours. So you, you pay for a breakfast and not an evening meal. Um, I know this is really expensive for the Trust, which is food. However, I do honestly think that to try and keep staff um, and to help with the cost of living, that that's something that trust should really look at. Um, and I know that during COVID, we had a lot of this um, fundraising, as it were, by the public, who were absolutely brilliant, um, to help with the NHS personnel. And I'm just wondering whether this would be something that should be suggested to go going forward. And I mean the meal was not public funding but you know the public may like to do it I think it's a real kind of ethical and moral decision isn't it because to to divert money for uh, NHS treatment to pay for staff meals is something that um, I I'm not aware of public sector organizations doing and and, and it's very difficult um, with the number of staff. We're one, yeah, I think we're the biggest employer. I think ESNEF has 10,000 staff. And at a time of such financial difficulty, I think it's, it's an incredibly difficult dilemma around. And it, it certainly you know, merits discussion. But if we choose to spend our money in that way, I think... Nick Hume will always say we have a lot of money, it's how we choose to spend it. If we choose to spend a big proportion of our mo money on feeding staff, then there are other things, other treatments that we will have to compromise on. And whether the public and the taxpayer would accept that when there's a lot of people that aren't working in the NHS who are also struggling with the cost of living is probably a, more of a political discussion than, than for us, but um, I, it would be, uh, there's nothing we would love more than to feed our staff, but I think it's, it's whether the public would accept that is difficult. Thank you. Um, thank you, and I, and I appreciate everything, everything that you have said, but if it comes down to the crunch, i.e. are we going to have staffing in our hospitals or are we not, and that would keep people, I think the public would probably, in my opinion, be very supportive. Um, but everyone has their, has their own opinion. Um, I was also really interested in what you were saying about um, uh, su support in the hospitals for, um, for parents, for the maternity services as such. Um, I don't do it now, so I haven't declared it, but I used to work in the chaplaincy at the West Suffolk Hospital, um, and one of my sites, because I asked to do it and started it, was to actually visit maternity, because I believed that there was the opportunity to actually engage with new parents, particularly, and I'm sorry, gentlemen, you know, if you're a woman and you've had a baby and you know what it's like and sometimes someone else just sitting there talking to them actually prevented a few issues in the in the future so my question is do the chaplaincy still go into the hospital maternity services or not uh, so i can i can only talk for esneft but absolutely the chaplaincy services do go into maternity services they will do they do a round for of all clinical areas 
uh, but of course if there is a specific request for any family that wishes to receive the support of chaplaincy which is spiritual not necessarily religious uh, then, then that support is available we also do have the NHS reservist program as well where, where we have staff who are coming in uh, to support the clinical team but also offer that time to be able to sit uh, with families and, and have a conversation and offer practical support as well. So there are a variety of different services to offer uh, uh, more of a peripatetic service uh, to, to families in, in, in maternity. You'll all be very pleased to know that this is my, probably my last question. Um, but j just to finish on um, what um, Dr Thorpe was, was actually saying, um, working in a chaplaincy in a hospital is an absolute joy and a privilege um, and to be able to be in the maternity services and sometimes the outcomes were difficult for us volunteers to deal with um, but we did um, and it was also an absolute privilege and I hope everybody realizes that um, and my last question is because um, maternity services have had a bad press and I think Dr Thorpe actually touched on it earlier um, and it was to do with the nitrous oxide um, issue. But because maternity services have had this poor grading in Suffolk by the CQC, have you had any, many or some um, requests from pregnant people to actually go elsewhere, i.e. out of the county? Um, if I can answer that. Um, not that I'm aware of. So obviously it's somebody's choice if they wish to birth, el birth elsewhere and so not, we wouldn't necessarily know if they had chosen that reason for and the reasons why. Um, but none that I am aware of, no. Um, if you look at our, so how we get our feedback, we get our feedback via our Facebook page, via the MVP, um, also via our own friends and family that we do. Also, if you look at our CQC survey that just recently, um, we got the results of last year. You know, all of it is very, very positive. So um, there is nothing there that's telling me that people are looking at the results of the CQC and asking to go elsewhere. Um, when we had our, our CQC result back in 2019, um, when it landed, that was obviously one of the biggest fears is that women wouldn't want to come, and that was not the case whatsoever. Um, so I think, yeah, no, that has not been my um, kind of experience. I, I don't know if Giles... Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I would absolutely echo what Karen said. Uh, we haven't seen evidence of that. Of course, the only time that we would see uh, women crossing the county line was if they were moving from Ipswich to Colchester, but that would only be from a, from a position of activity. Again, we've had our, um, our national staff survey results that have come back that have actually shown an improvement. Uh, we continue, of course, to work on uh, experience to ensure that it's the best that it possibly can be at every point during a birthing journey. Uh, uh, but no, there, there haven't been any specific requests to be moving out of, out of the county of Suffolk, as far as I'm aware. If I may, just, just to end. Um, having um, seen the CQC in action in, in um, different areas of the NHS, I think what is positive about the CQC coming in and finding these results for you all is the fact that there is a lot of input into the services to actually make sure that they come up to standards. So my end is well done to you all for actually taking note of the CQC and actually working towards um, a, a better grading hopefully soon for you all. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. And um, I, I would just echo what you have said, Councillor, because I think um, there has been a lot of focus on maternity services, both nationally and actually not just in Britain, I mean, in, in Ireland as well. I'm, I'm Irish, so it, the patterns are very similar. And clearly maternity services is such an important service. It's difficult to provide perfectly. And um, I think we're here to to be, you know, the critical friend and, and to, on behalf of the public, to, to um, highlight what's going on, you know, for better or worse. And um, I think really we're, I, I sense we're on a, 
on an improvement trajectory here, and that's, that's, that's really welcome. I, I just have a little question myself that um, hasn't been asked, and, and I wonder whether, from your point of view, there is a, a difference in your capacity to provide good services for home births versus hospital births, and whether there are any issues around, you know, if, if a birth is happening in a community or a home and things start to go wrong about the um, capacity for emergency transport to a clinical setting. Yeah, okay, if I can answer that. Um, so we offer a home birth service. The only time that we didn't offer a home birth service was right at the very beginning of COVID, um, and that's where it was deemed not to be safe to do so, but I soon got that ruling, uh, that overruled at the West Suffolk, um, because actually home births are the most safest place for somebody to give birth if they are of a low risk um, pregnancy, um, so absolutely home births. Our provision, like anything, is very much dependent upon the staffing and we do need to have two midwives who are available to go out per home birth. So there are occasions that we are unable to support a home birth because we cannot make it safe for the staffing elements. Um, but the person is always made aware of that before they are kind of in a way signed up to, do a home, to have a home birth. We liaise very regularly with the ambulance service and they will let us know if there is an increase in their response times. So we have very clear kind, um, clear of what it would be classed as a, an emergency and then what would be an urgent um, and they will give us the approximate time frames. And at no point has there been a recorded delay because of um, the ambulance service um, you know, being unable to respond in, a, in the time frame. So. And if I may just to provide assurance, that's a similar position, obviously, for East, Suff East Suffolk and Ipswich as well. We work very, very closely with the ambulance service, um, recognising, of course, as we have been through a degree of strike activity, um, but they have prioritised appropriately uh, so that uh, uh, pregnant people and their families are prioritised if they do require transfer into the, into the acute setting. But again, similarly to West Suffolk, where staffing is available, we will always support home births at Esneft. Great, thank you very much. And I think it's time now to, um, oh, sorry, um, Councillor Lockington. Can I just, um, one thing we haven't touched on is cesarean sections. Do you keep an eye on how many women now get and how does that compare to a few years ago? You know, is, is it easier now to, because I remember speaking to a group of four young mums and two of them, you know, I said, how was, how was it for you here uh, giving birth? And they said, oh, we had to say in section. So I certainly thought two out of four was, you know, so has that number gone up and do you look into <laughs> So when we talk about cesarean sections, we have to be really careful that we're not deeming one way of birthing rather than another as um, less natural or negatively. So how someone births is absolutely down to their choice or then what occurs during the labour. Um, we have seen an increase over the last couple of months in people requesting a caesarean section, but that might be for many, many reasons. Um, so we have seen an increase in that and we have also seen a decrease in the number of emergency caesarean sections that we've had to do. Um, but it you know, that is, it's a very kind of variable and something that really we don't give too much, we can't look at in too much detail because it, at the end of the day, it is that person's choice if they wish to request a caesarean section. Can I just ask, if anybody requested, can they have it? Yes, yeah. Okay. Thank you, if, if I just make, uh, literally I've got the year's data in front of me, so, so there, there have been minimal fluctuations in relation to the number of elective caesarean sections and also emergency caesarean sections. So, um, but you know, picking up Karen's point, ultimately it's a pregnant person's right to choose, it's their body and how they wish to deliver. Our, 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 our responsibility is to ensure that we provide the services that meets their choice. Uh, but certainly we have not seen, there's nothing which is statistically significant in terms of increase. Good, well thank, thank you very much. Um, if there are no concluding comments or questions, um, Andy, do you want to 
comment or do you have a question before we close this down? Thank you. I wasn't going to. I did have a couple of things, but you've been grilled all, all morning. Um, I suppose there's just one observation about um, diversity workforce when you were talking about cultural change, especially in, in the Ipswich and Colchester areas. Um, now that you're getting closer to having sort of fewer vacancies, you can maybe start focusing on how diverse that workforce is, because that helps with the, with the cultural uh, issues. And the other thing was you talked a lot about vulnerable, vulnerable people and what you're doing. Uh, and it was really good to know that you're talking to charities, local community groups and so on. I was just really wondering whether or not you also have a, a close relationship with the local refugees um, and whether or not you've identified or you're able to identify if somebody is a modern day slave uh, if they appear. <laughs> um, to answer the last one, yes we do. So part of our safeguarding training is talking about modern day slavery, absolutely. And our um, safeguarding midwife uh, has been on specialist courses for it. I do think people do think, especially in the West, sleepy Suffolk, you know, not a lot goes on here. And that's where you have the real hidden, well not so hidden, but you do have real pockets. So yes, we do, we are very much aware and we work with all the agencies regarding that. Um, and again, regarding whether it's the Women's Refuge or we, we, we absolutely work with everybody within our kind of geographical area, yes. We would like to work more with volunteers, yes please, thank you, we would love that. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, thank you. I think from our, our perspective, Andy, uh, we very much take a safeguarding families approach. Uh, so our safeguarding team spans the lifespan uh, of an individual and therefore we will have specialists that it's not only our, our named midwife for safeguarding, but it's our, the whole of our safeguarding team that will provide that, that support. There is obviously a low degree of suspicion. Of course, you'll know that we have particular areas of, of deprivation. Uh, which bring their own challenges. So, so we're, we're actively always looking to ensure that we're safeguarding each individual and each newborn uh, as they uh, come into the world. Um, I think in relation to our workforce, absolutely. Um, we need to ensure that we do have a diverse workforce. Um, I'm, I'm personally very much involved in the Getting to Equity programme, which is run by the Chief Nursing Officer for, for, for England in ensuring that we are um, not only looking at those people that are entering the profession, but are progressing in the profession, are becoming the leaders of the profession, that are representative of the communities that we serve. So it's, it's very, very much front and centre of the equality, diversity and inclusion work that we do, not only in maternity services, but across the workforce of 11,500 people at SNFT. Good, thank you. Thank you all very much. And um, thank you, panel members. Um, do feel free to stay if you'd like, but I'm sure you're all extremely busy and um, we want to go on and make sure that the women of Suffolk are properly cared for um, with the maternity services. Um, we'll take a short break, I think, um, and reconvene to consider the bulletins and the forward work plan. And following that, we're going to have lunch, and then we will reconvene at half past one to consider the um, work of the task and finish group on childhood um, weight and obesity. Thank you.
Right. Um, thank you, members. We're going to reconvene the meeting. And um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, the um, running order is such that we're going to consider the information bulletins and forward work plan standing items and um, adjourn for lunch and then we will <coughs> reconvene at half past one to consider the um, <coughs> task and finish groups work on tackling childhood obesity <coughs> and we will I hope be joined by um, some members of the education and children's services scrutiny at that time. Um, so moving on to agenda item um, seven, <coughs> which is the information bulletin. Has everyone had a chance to look at the bulletins and does every, anyone have any comments or um, issues they'd like to raise based on having looked at them? Sorry, yes, page 59, agenda item seven. Um, yes, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, um, yes, this James Padgett, as, uh, as Keith mentioned, I think we really do need to hear from them as soon as they, well, when they get their CQCs public, because we need to know what's going on, don't we? An, an update, if nothing else, please. Right, maybe we need to have a report from James Paget um, for our next meeting in July. Um, Councillor Maybury? Yes, thank you, thank you Chairman. Um, I'm absolutely amazed, perhaps I'm being foolish here, but I'm absolutely amazed at the length of time it takes to make an appointment for phlebotomy. I am just absolutely horrified because I'm, I'm going to suggest to my colleagues here that normally you only have a blood test if there is a need for one, i.e. it's yeah. fairly urgent. So I'm just amazed at the length of time that it's taken. I'm obviously very um, <laughs> sheltered with my GP surgery who, um, who actually do it within, can give you an appointment within a couple of days. That's amazing. So I, I actually think that, that um, phlebotomy needs to be well and truly looked at. This is just, <coughs> I just find it incredible, the length of days. <coughs> right, um, I think, um, Margaret, you have some, you, you, I think, initially raised this as an issue. Uh, I have. So, um, uh, Councillor Mabry, you're absolutely right. Um, this came up to me by a number of members of the public, and then I was asked to become involved in it more, uh, in a more of a deep dive. And, and I'm very grateful to the NHS because they have involved me in the programme with the person who is actually uh, informing on this, Liz Maloney, who is working solely on this project. And you will be really pleased to hear, I took it straight to Ed Garrett, and he shoved it straight to the top of the Integrated Care Board program so uh, I'm very grateful for that because you're absolutely right it, it's a fundamental test without that test people don't know what's wrong with them and without knowing what's wrong with them their anxiety levels increase and maybe their illness gets worse and as you can see the time scales for waiting historically you could go to West Suffolk Hospital sit outside the door or go in and have your blood test and walk out now there's between two and a half and a month wait that's apparently because of staffing levels. Uh, people don't want to remain in phlebotomy because it's not a terribly exciting role, you know, and it's not particularly well paid. So people leave it either to progress and become a care assistant or they leave altogether. And there didn't seem to be any sort of continuity of people flowing through the service. A another worrying statistic was people having to travel very long distances on buses and being elderly and sick. Um, and in, in the case of, if we went from Haverhill to Bury St Edmunds, you would have to change buses in, in Bury to get up to the hospital for that very small test. And so this is having a major overhaul. 
uh, as you can see, they have delayed the final report until after the election, which I think is absolutely fair and right, and there is a lot of work going on. But there are some real complexities in this, and not least to do with doctors' contracts, how much they agree to do, a lot of it's historic and needs an overhaul. And also in, in North East Essex, they have an independent provider who picks up any of the work that the GP surgeries don't do. So they've got a neat system running there, and we are hoping, perhaps, that that sort of thing can be uh, instilled here. So I, I would also ask, please, that after the elections and when Liz Maloney, and I think she's the person you really need to be communicating with on this now, when she's finished all of her work on this and looked at all the doctor's contracts and what people have agreed to do, what remains to be done, who is going to pick that up, how it's going to pick that up, and how we avoid people making these unnecessary journeys and waiting these protracted lengths of time. So these are questions we need answering, and if we could have that back, not just as an information bulletin, but for them to come before us, because each discrete area will have its own problem. You know, transport's different in each area, doctor surgeries are different, so how they're going to manage those different areas and bring together some coordinated response to this. So thank you for that. And I hope, um, I hope Margaret, uh, maybe that has helped to reassure you that something quite robust is happening in the background. Uh, um, it, it does. I, obviously, I am very, very lucky with my GP surgery and um, all points to them for continuing to, to do that service. But thank you, it does. Thank you. And um, Councillor um, Robinson. Thank you, Chair. Um, those of you who have been on the health scrutiny for a period of time will remember I've jumped up and down about phlebotomy and waveney several times. Um, and if looking at the report from North Health Service Waveney Integrated Care Board, um, does not record detail. Of course they don't. They farmed it all out to the doctors and they only do blood tests internally in the hospital for hospital patients. Um, and the, the, the consistency of the service from the doctors, well, there isn't a consistency, it's a potluck. Um, and receptions do not necessarily um, take any note of the regard for urgency when they're booking these appointments. Um, but there we go. Okay. Um, I notice it says that the um, patients in Waveney won't be affected by the review, the SNE review. Is, is that something we're happy with? Or I, I suppose it's a different system, isn't it? Yeah, they set it up. That it's on, Jay, it's on a different Page schedule. does not take any responsibility for They farmed it all out. said, we don't want to do it anymore. Down to the doctors, mm. individual doctors. And they won't do blood tests at the hospital for uh, blood tests ordered by the doctors, and the doctors won't do blood tests on behalf of the hospital. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we sort of skipped through um, the... Sorry, the... I'm still on the bulletins. Um, the NSFT update on inspection findings. Um, I think we are considering having um, this is for we're considering having NSFT back with us again in July, and I think um, probably we should do that and address you know the, the link that's in our bulletin then if people are happy with that. Um, just changes to the commissioning of primary care. I think. You know, this is obviously um, something that we're not sure of the implications of that quite yet, but um, Inga. Maybe we could look at that in the autumn when it's, you know, so we can look at how it's going in the autumn. Inga, I think that would be a very good idea because I think there will be changes in commissioning approach and, cha and pooling of funding going on and that kind of thing will be quite complex. And I, I would welcome that to be on our, on our autumn agenda as well. Um, <clears throat> Flipophony and Waveney. Um, Stella Morris update. I think, has everyone read this? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, this was um, a, scrutiny, a main scrutiny item, the Stella Morris 
um, situation. But um, has anyone, is everyone satisfied with the content of the report that we've seen? Or do we need to look at this again? Um, Inga. I, I think the main report often went back to the main scrutiny committee. So have, has this gone back to them too? And have we got any response from the main scrutiny if they are happy with it? Um, I think we, we need to make sure that this does go to them because I, I don't believe this particular update has gone to them. Um, right, let's moving on to our forward work plan. Um, in July, we've got the um, dentistry coming to us, which was going to be today, but um, due to the availability of reports and um, the timing, that's on our main item for our agenda in July. Ah, sorry. Let's just... Before I go on to this, I think I neglected to mention the standing item from observers. So that might be relevant to what we discuss in July. So um, would anyone wish to report their observations from um, board meetings they've attended? Um, yes, Margaret. Uh, just a very quick update on the uh, new hospital build programme for West Suffolk. We, we are still waiting, uh, we haven't formally heard yet that the funding is coming through and there was a bit of a sea change at central government, goodness knows why it suddenly came, came up, but they decided to include all of the rat plank hospitals which were not originally all included. And there was a slight worry originally that that might dilute funding and other people might lose out. However, I am led to believe, and it's not official or agreed yet, but I am led to believe that they will be incorporated without reduced funding. We have not yet got our funding, but one of the really strong points, of course, is West Suffolk Hospital has its planning, so it now is further forward than any other rat plank hospital, so it puts us in a massively strong position now. And, of course, despite um, waiting for that planning application, which was very tenuous, I have to say, we thought it was going to walk it, and it was a chairman's decision. It was a really t hairy and very scary day, but we are pleased to say that it sensibly did go through. Um, but despite that, all of the people like Lisa and those working in the background to look at things like how they're going to do the non-acute services and where they're going to be located, uh, relocated, and all that work is happening. And just to say, one of the things that I went to see, and I would urge you all to go and look at it, and hopefully it'll get replicated through, is hospital at home. This is not, um, this is a completely new program. So these are people who should still be in hospital. They need that level of hospital care, but a complete team has been put together. All the monitoring equipment is at the hospital. The people are given an iPad, apart from monitoring equipment when they go home. They have immediate contact with a clinician, but they can go home and be treated in exactly the same way as they would in hospital. And the program is up and running and successful. And it will really make a difference to uh, bed blocking because people who can go home, <coughs> which means that people who've got perhaps children at home or relatives that they worry about, their anxiety levels will be reduced because they can go home and be treated at home. The only condition is they must remain at home and they mustn't go wandering off into the community because they are still sick and they are still at home. But it's a tremendous programme. It's being run by West Suffolk and I do urge you, if you get the opportunity, go along and see it. It really is revolutionary. So thank you. All is progressing well for West Suffolk and we look forward to that build programme uh, progressing. I spoke to Gary Norgate on my way here this morning and he's just firing on all cylinders. So great news. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much, Margaret. That's very good news. Um, let's see, Heidi, would you like to comment? Yes. Thank you very much, yeah. Um, the care to be um, sort of applied at home is called a virtual ward, and this has been sort of um, introduced by all the trusts nationwide. So it is indeed a very, very good program, and it has been started quite early on in Edinburgh in Cambridgeshire. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, is anyone else? Um, Debbie Richards. <coughs> on the every birth every day, just to, to mention that the last meeting, which was on the, 
the uh, 31st of January this year, said that despite what uh, Charles Thorpe mentioned, uh, there was a per per perinatal mortality deep dive into stillbirths that happened in March, which they haven't actually you know, mentioned results of to anybody yet. Uh, so they do realise there is a problem and they're trying to deal with it, but they're being very hush hush about it. Thank you very much. And um, that's something, if that, once that becomes in the public domain, I think we probably need to have that information come to us here. Um, Inga? Uh, yes, I think one, one thing from SNFT is that we probably need an update on the orthopedic hospital because that's very much a joint hospital. A lot of the um, uh, papers that come to SNFT is Sometimes it's difficult to think about what is actually for Suffolk people, what is for, you know, Essex, and uh, because there's certain issues around Clacton and so on. So some papers deal more with with that end of SNF trust. But the uh, orthopedic hospital, I think we need an update there and uh, to see how they are getting on with that and preparing for it. I know the building is well underway. Um, and also, um, we need to go back because we were invited that we could probably visit Ipswich Hospital. So we need to think about how we do these visits in future into hospitals. Yeah. Thank you, Inga. Um, I just wonder, in regard to the orthopaedic centre at Colchester, whether that isn't something that the um, joint task and finish group, the um, in North East Essex and South Suffolk task group, shouldn't receive an update on because that was set up for that purpose. So um, perhaps we could follow up with that um, with our colleagues in Essex mm -hmm. and bring that report to the committee, to this committee for all members. Um, <clears throat> right. Um, so, and if any other comments or issues regarding um, reports from observers. Um, I'll move on now to agenda item nine then, the forward work plan. And as I said, we have dentistry, so the um, commission improvement of dental services, um, including access to orthodontics, is on our forward work plan for the 12th of July. Um, we also have <clears throat> um, an update from the NSFT on how they are responding to the most recent um, CQC inspections. Um, those are the two main items. Um, in advance of this meeting, we are also hoping to set up some visits from members to go to NSFT service locations um, and meet staff and I think we need to have those meetings, obviously, in the next, probably June time frame. So that doesn't leave a lot of time, particularly if there are new members on the committee. Um, so, Teresa, are you able to act on that? Yeah, and hopefully we might have three locations, um, west, west of the county, Ipswich, and possibly um, the Waveney area to visit. <clears throat> so everyone's happy with that. In terms of information bulletins for our next meeting, um, Teresa, can you just list what you've noted? So there were several items there we, that were mentioned. Um, I know we the phlebotomy services. Are we going to put that on the forward work plan for um, the autumn meeting, or do we want any further update prior to that? Put it, put it onto our agenda for the autumn meeting. I think as a as a full item. Um, yeah, and and include in terms of the reports for the July meeting. James Paget's. Um, inspection report should be available and should come to that meeting. And um, we also, at our 
pre-meeting, we discussed pharmacies and sustainability of community pharmacies and their role. And um, that might be something we put on our agenda for the autumn meeting as well. Um, Inga? Could we add to that the availability of medicine so that we learn about, you know, whether there are certain drugs that is, won't be available or very much delayed for people who really rely on certain drugs? Yes, I think let's, let's um, put availability of medicines. And um, <clears throat> I know that the pricing of medicines is also highly variable. Whether that is something this committee could request information on or not, I'm, I'm not sure. But I, I know it does affect supply. Yes, Heidi. Um, thank you. And I would like to know, with regard to pharmacists, how they feel to be empowered now to give um, medical advice. Are they, are they feeling equipped with, for it or not? Something like an update on that one would be nice as well for the autumn meeting. Right. Um, and we had also talked about possibly having some information in autumn about the Better Care fan, um, Fund and new arrangements for um, pooled funding. I know we've got a workshop coming up um, soon on that, but these are all changes that are happening within the um, ICS system. And um, I think it would be helpful for the committee to be aware of what those are. And um, particularly in relation to our partners. Um, I just wonder whether that subject might not be something that we could tackle as a joint scrutiny item with the main scrutiny committee. Um, but perhaps we can consider an approach to that um, once we know a little bit more about how it's going to work. Is there anything else that I've left out in terms of the forward plan? Um, Andy. Sorry, Chair, I need to go in a couple of minutes. So um, just to, some thoughts in response to what you've just discussed and what's coming up in your forward plan. Um, phlebotomies come up um, in our uh, community development work. So over the next few months, our community development officers are going to be visiting um, phlebotomy teams and speaking to people who are using those services both across the west and the east of the county. Um, and we can come back and provide you with a report uh, at the suitable time. You were talking about um, pharmacy and um, dentistry. As you all know now that as of the 1st of April, integrated care boards are now responsible for um, just those two uh, in terms of commissioning, but also optometry. So you may want to consider that, that whole thing and see and ask the ICBs how they're going to be adopting that responsibility and what their priorities might be. Um, what you're talking about uh, in terms of cost and availability of medication from pharmacies like HRT, for example, uh, are very key uh, to, um, to people out there. And um, dentistry, again, we can provide you with a report because that's been a key issue for us nationally and locally as a health watch for the last, well, since COVID started. Um, and then lastly, I was just going to say that uh, we've got two reports that we're going to be publishing in May. Uh, one, well, one uh, part, sorry, we're, they're both ready, but we're going to publish them after the elections. Um, one is a really, really detailed piece of work about dementia care uh, and dementia services. And uh, that's something that we've done through our core uh, work but uh, it, it involved over 100 uh, people surveyed, more than 20 people interviewed, uh, and there were a couple of films. We were really lucky to get uh, individuals who were willing to speak about their uh, experiences. And if you want to look at dementia care, uh, and there are lots of reasons to do so, for example, you may or may not know that in the west of Suffolk, you will wait far longer to be assessed about dementia than you will than you would do so in the east of the county. I don't know about Wavy at the moment. So there are disparities across the system um, 
as well as um, uh, variances in terms of quality of care. And the other report we will be publishing is on health coaching, uh, which is something that's really, really important that came from Suffolk originally, uh, and it's the responsibility of West Suffolk Hospital to provide training. Uh, in essence, it's about clinicians and professionals working slightly differently with patients. So rather than telling the patients what to do uh, for their care planning, uh, they talk, discuss the care plan together, and they come up with ideas together. Uh, the experience of the individual is as important as the knowledge of the, the professional. And the training is being delivered to everyone from GPs, nurses, to uh, social prescribers as well in the voluntary sector. So I think that might be of interest for you as well. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot, lot to consider there. Um, yes. Can I ask you when the dementia report will be out, please? As soon as we think it's absolutely at the right time after the election. Because it, we, need to, we need to put it in our plan because it's really important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it is ready. Um, right. It's just that we felt that we'd better not publish anything just now until uh, mid-May, probably. Okay. Right. Can we put it in? We'll, we'll get the information um, if included in, in, as soon as it's ready as a bulletin for our next meeting, if it's ready. Um, yes, Margaret. Very quickly, on the dentistry one, could we just have a look at the old contract and to see whether any of our recommendations were implemented? Because I know from the dentists they're not happy with the new contract. So if we could see those and, and see what was implemented and, and why perhaps our recommendations weren't adopted, because I think there was no point in making them if nobody took any notice of them. Um, but I gather that the dentists are not happy with what's come out. So perhaps we could look at that in the round with dentistry. Um, s certainly, and, and I think just, just to say that, you know, our pattern is to follow up on our recommendations. And, you know, that's part of the purpose of this meeting, absolutely, with the addition of orthodontics and the new contract. Yeah. Um, Andy? No, just one point on dentistry. I know you've um, heard from Gregory Brown in the past, who's leading on the task force for Suffolk North East Essex. Norfolk and Waveney now have a task force as well. So I, I imagine you'd want to invite them as well. Thank you, yes, we'll, we'll make a note of that. Um, right, um, if, I think that's pretty much it for the forward work plan. Um, looks um, like there's a, a lot going on. Um, just briefly before we adjourn for lunch, I want to mention the quality accounts for 2022-23. Um, you'll be aware that um, at this time of year, the NHS providers are required to send draft copies of their quality accounts to stakeholders for comment. And um, <clears throat> the Suffolk Health Scrutiny Committee has in previous years not provided individual comments on these reports, um, mostly because we haven't allowed time to properly study them and, um, <clears throat> and dig into their content. So we don't feel we're really in a position to comment on them. And um, we have a general statement that we are using to respond to all of the stakeholders and um, <clears throat> board observers may wish to liaise directly with the providers if they have any particular comments or questions. So can I ask members if you are happy to take the same approach this year for quality accounts? A general affirmation, it seems that that's the case. Thank you. Um, right. It's time to adjourn for lunch, and um, we'll reconvene at half past one in an hour's time um, to hear the um, Childhood Obesity Task Force reports. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon, everyone. And um, we are now reconvening to um, consider the agenda item, um, <clears throat> I believe it's agenda item six, the final report of the Joint Scrutiny Task and Finish Group on tackling childhood obesity. <clears throat> um, I'm very pleased to, to welcome members of the Education and Children's Services Scrutiny Committee who are joining us for consideration of this item. And um, <clears throat> Councillor Spicer, thank you very much for taking over leadership of this group um, following um, the very sad loss of Councillor Graham Newman. Um, back in April 2022, we jointly considered the, to the topic of tackling childhood obesity in Suffolk. And as a result, <clears throat> This task and finish group was set up to consider the topic in more detail. This is not a scrutiny item, and officers have not been invited to be present. However, if committee members have specific questions arising from the report, um, <coughs> which uh, <coughs> should be directed at officers, they will be included in the minutes and a written response can be provided um, as follow-up. I now have pleasure in welcoming Councillor Joanna Spicer, Chairman of the Task and Finish Group, to introduce the group's report and highlight the key findings and recommendations. And um, I, I would add that <clears throat> the role of the Health Scrutiny Committee is to consider the report, hopefully to endorse its recommendations, but we may have some additional notes or suggestions of our own which wouldn't alter the report, but would be delivered in parallel to it um, to feed into the <clears throat> update to the Suffolk Health and Wellbeing Board um, strategy on child weight management. And this will be coming to the Health and Wellbeing Board at its May meeting. So please go ahead, Councillor Spicer. Uh, thank you very much, um, Councillor Fleming. And thank you, members, for not just in setting up this, uh, the initiative behind this task and finish group, um, but being part of it and being here today and staying on this afternoon when the sun's shining, because it, it's really important. Um, as the chairman said, our report is on page 29 of your papers today. As we've had, I think, eight meetings, I could sit here for the next three or four hours on the subject but I'm not going to, you'll be pleased to note. I just want to touch on the big picture and then on a little bit about the process that we applied to get there and then most importantly, what next and how you can help with all of that. Um, I'm going to talk about obesity and use that word quite deliberately today. We have a lot of discussion. I could just say overweight. I could, as is the trendy modern language, talk about healthy weight, or even unhealthy weight. But we, the, the word obesity was set by you, the scrutiny committee at the beginning, um, and we adopted that and have used it throughout. But I'd welcome your thoughts on language, actually. I think it's quite interesting. Um, and, and, you know, ought we to be a bit more coy and talk about healthy weight? Or should we call obesity, obesity? We'll have to see. It is a national issue. This isn't, of course, just Suffolk. Um, but there is a growing awareness, a concern. At least I hope, I think there is. There is the National Childhood Measurement Programme. I'm not going to ask you to put your hands up. Are you all aware of the National Childhood Measurement Programme? It means that down by district ward, you c children who are, are measured in reception and again in year six before they leave, move on from primary school, um, and those, that data, not very out of date, actually, is all on the Suffolk Observatory and on um, National Department of Health, whatever it's called these days, uh, websites. So we know that in Suffolk, there are significant numbers of children who are overweight and obese, and it is going up. Now, if you think about the demographics of Suffolk, and we have areas of deprivation, we have areas of prosperity, we have rural, we have urban. We should not be an outlier on something like obesity. We really shouldn't. 
Um, being overweight can have a really negative effect on children's emotions, emotional health and well-being, as well as their physical health and well-being as they grow up. They could get stigmatised, low self-esteem, often then leading to poorer educational outcomes, which then, of course, affects their longer-term life prospects. So, you know, it, it isn't just a chubby child in the playground. What we need to be bold enough to think is about a whole life of that child. Um, and the evidence, national evidence, suggests that the overweight children and adolescents are more likely to become obese as adults. Um, they're also potentially at risk of mental health problems as well as the physical health problems that we know follow on from being overweight. So as the chairman said, um, a task and finish group was proposed by you, the Health Scrutiny Committee, and you very wisely, in my view, invited the Education and Children's Scrutiny, Children's Services Committee, get that right, of which I'm a member, to join with you, and we had a joint discussion, a joint meeting, and the task and finish group was put underway. Um, as the chairman's already alluded to, Graham Newman had a, a really strong, and actually I use that word carefully, passionate interest in this subject, and it was obvious that he should chair it, because he was chairman of the Children's Scrutiny Committee. And you can imagine after two meetings what a shock it was to us as a group, um, his very untimely um, death. Uh, and I was prevailed upon to step up. And at this point, I will thank our very small but um, passionately keen committee, uh, Inga, oh, sorry, Councillor Lockington, <laughs> Councillor Shaw, Councillor Back, and Councillor Martin, who I thought was coming this afternoon. Um, and we've been very, very ably supported by Theresa Harden up there, um, who's put in so much work, not just planning our meetings and witnesses and evidence, but in actually compiling the report, which um, has been quite a challenge, not because it was, but just because there was so much. Um, and I want to put on record, not just my personal, but the whole group's thanks to Theresa. Um, so, the more we met, the more we realised how complex it was, how, and for a small group of councillors to try and get through all the issues would be too much and too long. So we did pick out some key issues. Now, it's probably worth me just pointing out that these are on page 32 um, of your report. And we broke those into three areas um, where we th thought... And all along, we had a bit of a mantra that we mustn't come up with a recommendation that wasn't actually deliverable. So we didn't want fine words like, you know, suggest the government change the policy on this. We wanted things which were deliverable, either by us or by our close partners. So, as you can see, um, paragraph seven, we wanted to focus on the actual availability and opportunities of physical activity in schools. Um, secondly, we wanted to know what happened as a result of the data that was collected through the National measurement, Child Measurement Programme. And you can see the areas have followed, and that was an extremely interesting exercise. And thirdly, we looked at healthy eating in school, which actually didn't turn out to be... In fact, we, we were rather amazed how careful um, suppliers of school meals are. No salt, no sugar you know, um, change of things. And we looked at, at all sorts of things. So perhaps the first two is where we've, a lot more of our recommendations relate to, which are, are in the report. So we thought we're not going to be able to solve it, but we've got to be really clear that we understand the environment we're, we're operating in um, uh, and, and, and the governance that surrounds it. You know, we're a county council. There's clearly things for district councils here, particularly around roles as planning authorities and whatever you call it, sport, leisure. There's clearly a role for school governors um, and difficulty too, schools such as still education authority schools and those which are academies. So we, we meant that we really did have to make sure that the recommendations we came up with, which are on summarised, they're through the report and then summarised on pages 53 and 54 were actually going to be deliverable by somebody and made sense um, and, and weren't um, 
Uh, and we will, I, I think this is the point at which I need to move to explaining what I think will be the route map. Is that the right jargon? Um, if you are willing, as a health scrutiny committee, to endorse the report today, and we welcome suggestions, um, and it's been, we've invited the Education Children's Scrutiny Committee, some of them are here, thank you very much, um, to endorse that. It will go next with our recommendations, assuming you endorse them, to the Suffolk Health and Wellbeing Board. And they meet in the middle of May. And on the Health and Wellbeing Board is not just the County Council. It's not their board, it's a partnership board. And that includes the NHS and the District and Borough Councils and the, and the voluntary sector as well. So um, the Health and Wellbeing Board had a strategy called Tackling Childhood Obesity in Suffolk, which was actually published about four or five years ago now. And they are wanting to refresh this. So thanks to the diplomacy and hard work of Teresa um, Harden, the, you, the report, if you agree it today, or however we come to today, will be taken on board by the Health and Wellbeing Board, and our recommendations will form part of the refresh, I think that's the word they use, refreshed action plan. Um, I fear this report, this strategy, is chiefly being um, derailed by COVID. Um, I'm not, I don't want to be too critical because it's a subject you're never going to think, but it, we, it, there's a real lesson. You don't want reports which are full of agreed actions and then there, there's no, no system in place to monitor and, and make sure those actions happen. So if you agree the report today and it goes on to the Health and Wellbeing Board, um, I for one will be looking to see the members of that board actually take recommendations and actions, but make sure they happen. Which by the way, I'm sure you've heard from your chairman and officers, we as chairman, I chair the County Council's Audit Committee, we are all looking now to have systems in place so that recommendations and actions agreed by scrutiny committees actually are checked up on that they're done, or if they're not done, why they're not done. So uh, that, go, that will be in May. Um, I think I've already touched on, we have got a role as councillors to talk about difficult subjects, um, not, and by difficult I don't mean a pothole, I mean things that are sensitive, including mental health um, and well-being. Um, We'll each have different opportunities, whether district councillors, or some of you are both, or county councillors, through planning committees, through leisure provision, um, through school governorships that many of us do, to actually bear this issue, not, not just bear it in mind, put it forefront into conversations. I expect, like me as a councillor, I actually have, it's, it's fallen by the way a bit with COVID, but I used to try and have a meetings with chairs of governors and heads of head teachers at least once a year. I've got eight schools in my ward. I hope I would be brave enough now to raise this subject with them, um, which I might not have done before, but I've gained a new confidence, and it would be good if all councillors could have that confidence to raise what is a sticky subject. Um, and, for example, our planning committee... No, not our planning committee, sorry, County Council Cabinet Committee approved a programme of new build schools the other day and I'm still waiting for an answer from officers as to whether they all meet the national standards for the amount of playing fields. C can we chase up on that please? Yeah. Um, because, you know, we can't talk the talk if we don't actually do it and that would apply to, to those of you who are district councillors or sit on planning committees. You know, we can't say you must do the Daily Mile. We want to increase the numbers of schools participating in the Daily Mile if we've gone and ploughed up their playing field. Actually, I don't think we are doing that sort of thing, but you know. I keep forgetting we're live, aren't we? Don't like it. be careful. So I'm not going to go through all the recommendations. They're there. Um, I'd welcome any comments you've got. Um, I, I want to again thank 
um, not just the, the, the members of the group, but actually we had a huge long list of officers. Um, page 33, um, we met some enthusiastic ones, some cynical ones, some who were delighted that we were addressing the subject, some who thought we'd probably been there, done that before. But and as almost all our meetings were online. It wasn't easy. I found it's easy to be in a meeting when you all know each other anyway online, but when you've got faces usually moving around the screen of people you don't know. But they were, they were great, all of them to come. And I'd want to put on record that we were very grateful that we had that. Um, so lots of thanks. I'm not going to go through all the recommendations. Um, they're summarised at, the, at the end. I think it's... Um, where is the summary of the recommendations at the end of the report? End of the report, aren't they? Um, sorry, I'm just slipping on my page numbers. Here we are, pages 53 and 54. Um, and I, I think I have very grateful to Theresa Harden. We have obviously been sharing these recommendations with the team from Public Health and the people that support the Health and Wellbeing Board to make sure we're not going off at a tangent which they couldn't live with. Um, so I really welcome everybody's thoughts on the recommendations, on the report, on the subject in general. Um, and I should also thank El Elaine for coming because she wasn't on our um, Education Children's Scrutiny Committee, been, but she's now the chairman. She's taken Graham's place. So, and she's assured me that she's going to make sure we follow this through as our scrutiny committee. So thank you very much, Chairman. Thank, thank you very much. And um, I'd also like to thank um, our co-opted member, Francis Gilman, our parent governor, for coming today. Um, thank you very much. Um, Francis, have you, you have sat on the task and finish group? No. no. You haven't? Thank, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> before um, I open the, the floor up, um, I'd just like to say, <clears throat> by way of introduction, um, to thank this um, task and finish group for the really hard work that you've put in and, and supporting by, um, by our officers. Um, it's been an enormous amount of work, I can see that. <clears throat> and. Um, I would also like to um, <clears throat> just to mention the focus on what can actually be done, which is realistic. But I do think we need to be very ambitious in what we're asking for. And there are some things that should be done that won't be able to be done in a hurry. But I don't think we should shy away from mentioning things that, that are ambitious. We should be very ambitious because this report will feed into the Health and Wellbeing Board. It will hopefully gain the attention of the um, <clears throat> ICB and will be taken up by the um, Integrated Care Partnership members. It's a really important thing and um, I think we need to have a big ask for all of the members. We've got a very diverse membership here. We've got planners from the districts and boroughs. Um, we've got dentists and, you know, the state of children's teeth is closely related to their diet. And, um, you know, this is something that it, it all somehow comes together when you consider the costs versus the benefits of investing in, in improving in these areas. So I, I, I just think... <clears throat> um, we need to, to, to focus on, on the wider picture here. It's a, it's a big ask for schools. Schools can't do it all. Um, and just in terms of the language, you know, minding our language, I think for, the, um, for this task and finish group, my view is, which I'll give first, that um, the title of childhood obesity is absolutely correct. But I do have some sympathy. I think the, we're feeding into a report which is on weight management and I think I'm, I'm quite happy with that terminology for the refresh strategy actually because I think obesity implies a fairly high degree of being overweight and you know in many cases we're looking at 
a general lack of fitness amongst children. And, and, you know, it may not be a matter of being very overweight. It might be a matter of just starting on that trajectory, which builds up over time. So, uh, and, and of course, there are always children who are underweight as well, which will be included in the, um, in the Suffolk Wellbeing Board program. So, um, <clears throat> anyway, I'm, I'm happy with those terminologies. But uh, let's hand it over to the committee for questions and comments. Um, See, so I'm not sure who was first. Um, Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I read that and looked at the recommendations, and they're excellent. They're not, you're not asking for anything impossible. Um, everything is possible. My only criticism, and it's not a criticism of the Tarsen Finnish group, is this <coughs> is restricted basically to the skilled environment. Now, we all know that the ultimate arbiter and responsibility for the feeding of children and the activities of children are the parents. So we really need to, is there some way we can aim at the parents and the, and the home environment? Um, I mean, skill is only a small proportion of that child's life. Thank you. Please do. I'm glad you raised that, Councillor Robinson, because we did talk about it quite a lot. Um, and we're very mindful that our options in, in Suffolk, other than through school governing bodies, to talk to parents about this subject is, is really quite difficult. And, and I, I think probably it was Councillor Martin who pointed out how many hours a child is at home, as opposed to how many hours they're actually influenceable at school. Um, one of the things about pa parents that we have focused on um, in our discussions and I think two of the recommendations is around getting to school, of course, walking or cycling. There is a lot happening nationally about um, healthy eating for children. You know, the government have set up a series of task force and employed famous television personalities to try and promote, you know, Jamie Oliver and Henry Dimbleby and all these sort of things. Um, but, but I think it, it really did fall into the too difficult to have a meaningful recommendation, other than the ex important of getting exercise to school. Because it is, I think national government do try and work with the big food chains. That's something else we were told in our discussions, weren't we? About, you know, the, the big supermarket chains do have their ears bent a lot by government about how they... And the government done all sorts of things, you know, you have to put calories on all the food now and that sort of thing. It's a good point, but I, please don't think we ignored it. Thank you. Um, just on that topic, I, I, do, I, just, I just wanted to add, um, what happened to school kitchens? Um, I, mean, is, is, I mean, some schools have them, but... But um, children um, aren't required to eat school food, are they? And, and that's a problem. I mean, when I went to school, it wasn't an option. You ate school food or, or you didn't eat. So I think we're giving children too many choices, myself. And I realize that's probably an unpopular stance. But um, you know, if you don't have a choice and you're you know, a bit cold and hungry, you, you, you'll eat and you probably won't gain much weight. Um, so in a way, you know, we're, I feel sometimes we're tinkering around the problem by talking to supermarkets, but, you know, we're obviously doing what we can, but, but I think we do need to recognize there are fundamental problems in, 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 in diet that affects everyone, not just children. Um, Councillor Marks. Thank you. Yes, um, uh, as you will know, Joanna, that um, Graham asked me to become involved in this, and I was very reluctant to because I felt massively that it was going to be a difficult task, and I'm sure it has been. So before I turned turn him down, I did some research, and I actually went to parents, and I got amazingly, amazing abuse, pushback, denial, absolute. So the, the, the parents will not accept their children are overweight. So you have a big problem in, in persuading the parents that they have a problem. 
The other thing I note is that you first measure the children when they go to, to nursery. You know, a children's diet, the a child's diet is informed from the first thing you stick in their mouth uh, as a solid food. So I wonder if we could step back and say educating new mothers, because this is a great opportunity to educate new mothers, because new mothers tell me that it's also difficult, they, you know, taking stuff out when you go out with kiddies, but it isn't, because of course you can chop the top off a piece of fruit and shovel it in, you can take a yoghurt pot, you know, all the things we did, we need to re-educate them in what we did with our kids, and, and I think they've lost that, they think they've got to have convenience foods or they've got to make it, and we need to do a re-education there, because children's, children's food uh, diet is informed from the minute you stuff something in their mouth as a baby not when they're already at nursery and they've already got the diet of chocolates and chips that they're stuck in front of the TV with. Um, we all know that it's a 20-80, 80% what you eat, 20% what you move. We, we also know that fat children are not inclined to engage with sport because they're humiliated, they feel challenged, they don't feel engaged and you can't exactly say well we're going to have a specific sport for overweight children because then you're highlighting it. And the other problem I, I was disturbed at was when you do those measurements at school, I am told that the teacher is not allowed to be informed of which children are overweight. So that you've got compromised teachers, they, because you know, they may not be fully aware. And, and finally, what, the one thing I got from parents is they will listen to medical advice rather than advice coming from any other direction. So your idea about doing um, promotions and advertising will fall on deaf ears. They won't read it because they don't believe it in the first place. However, if a school nurse said, we've done a BM on your child and they are showing signs already of childhood obesity and we need to have a chat with you about this, I think you will have a breakthrough, particularly if you articulate to that parent the risks for that child going forward of developing obesity. So I think you've got to approach this from a whole different uh, perspective from a medical perspective to really shock the parents into the risks they're putting the children under. I think the softly, softly approach, going via the teachers, via the schools, via trying to get them to walk the extra mile, is absolutely not going to hit where you want it to hit. So I'm sorry if that sounds quite abrasive, but um, as you know, I don't... Um um, yes, to come back. Is it the other one? There we go. Um, I don't know if Councillor Bryce would agree with this, but we are on our committee looking at getting children school ready. So we've got an early years item coming up this year. And actually, what you've just said, Councillor Marks, links in potentially with that work we want to do. It is something we're talking about, the lack of support for new parents and what happens to a child up until they are um, school age. So it's that education. So I just wanted to come in at that point and say that is something that's on our radar as, a, as an education scrutiny committee. And thank you. And yes, Councillor Spice. Yeah, um, thank you to Councillor Marks for all of that. Um, on the last part of what you said about the communications and things, we have got a recommendation. It's number 13. Um, we looked at the letters and we discussed how GPs could because they get the information, but it, they don't have a system to flag it up. So that if Mother A has gone in because she's got bronchitis, um, there's nothing that reminds the doctor that little Johnny has been measured and might need a bit of advice to the mother. So we did have that conversation. Um, I'm going to have, with your permission, Chairman, to ask Teresa, did we talk at all with health visitors about advice they could give to young mothers, um, but preschool. So I'm not sure we did. Uh, we didn't speak no. with health visitors. Obviously, health visitors work under pub public health. Um, so we had the kind of lead officers from public health available for questioning. Um, but the strategy itself, early years wasn't actually covered in the terms of reference but the existing strategy and indeed the new strategy will have a major focus on early years as well as the other topics that are covered within this. Thank you for raising that because and Theresa, yeah. well I think Theresa are you suggesting that it's going to form part of what the health and wellbeing board are, are setting as 
Um, I think the, the refreshed strategy will not just focus on what's here, but it will have a much broader set of actions within it, uh, which will include actions around early years. Does that help? As a grandmother, I'm too well aware of these delicious sachets of every flavour of beef stew and dumplings all in a pack that, that actually it might be better to make it myself. But I think, yeah, it's a whole new subject, but uh, Theresa, could you make sure that's discussed with the officers preparing the strategy? Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I just add on to that? that um, I made quite a bit of a few notes when I was reading the, um, the report, and one of them was um, for us to, to suggest that this strategy adopt a, an approaches suitable for various age ranges rather than just putting out recommendations that could apply to virtually any age range. But, and the age sort of categories that I jotted down, and I, I'm just throwing these out, <clears throat> they may not be correct at all. One is the um, maternity services because, um, you know, I've noticed that you know, sometimes people put orange squash in babies' bottles, and you know, it starts really, really young, and um, you know that puts the young child on a path towards not just tooth decay, but but really bad dietary habits. Um, early years, primary, secondary, and post-16, and those were the sort of five categories that I identified as being, you know possible ways to approach this because the approaches will be very different. You won't be asking, you know, early years children to, to bike to school, for instance, or, or to do the daily mile. So I think we need to, in order to get results, you have to be very specific in your ask. And I think maybe there's a role for the Health Scrutiny Committee to, um, you know, piggybacking on the hard work that you've done, to, to put in a few targeted points and um, you know maybe that's something that we can do to, aug to augment the whole thing. Um, sorry, Councillor Sower. Um, yeah I agree with that because um, with all your comments actually because it's a very complex issue, a very complex subject. Um, I think all the recommendations you have given us are absolutely superb but what I think is I read school all the time, school, 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 and teachers are really overloaded already with a lot of responsibility and work. So would it maybe, maybe be an, an idea to produce a leaflet as Suffolk County Council to distribute the leaflet to all families with recommendations of how to sort of give children a healthy lifestyle at home? For example, having, they should try maybe to have the meals together, maybe try to have the TV off while they eat their dinners, things like that. But um, that might be an idea to produce a leaflet as Suffolk County Council and then distribute it. Um, yes, and I, in general, I mean, we, we, we were very conscious we didn't want to be a nanny state you know, this is what you've got to do. Um, one of the recommendations um, is about, well, particularly aiming at primary schools, I have to say, that group, was about sharing good practice because we picked up during the course of our evidence gathering some really innovative stuff. You all know about bicycling desks. Well, for 20 quid, you can have a little device you put under the chair and you're bicycling. Um, and we had good debates about competitiveness of sport and all sorts of things, and we're recommending that there really should be um, a, a county-wide or east and west event for school leaders, because often you've got very innovative members of staff, not just physical education, but form teachers, whatever. But the administration of a school, big or small, is so overwhelming that actually school leaders and not necessarily giving the priority to talking about exercise, fitness, diet, getting to school. I mean, I've talked to head teachers, for example, in my ward, 
about um, joining the Suffolk Road Safety Scheme, which gives you tabards and things and encourages children to walk. And you, they just sigh, oh, I've got too much on, oh, we're all too busy. So we do want to do something. Um, Theresa, do you want to comment on the idea of a leaflet? I mean, we, we've got to be mindful about spending money, but we think public health should be willing to spend a bit of money on the back of the Health and Wellbeing Board. Thank you. I think um, the... Sorry, I've got a blank now. <laughs> um, a leaflet is a good idea. One of the things, one of the recommendations that came out of the discussion was around r raising public awareness about the need to try and maintain healthy weight within families. And although the focus of this report was very much on the, those three terms of reference, which were primarily focused around what goes on in schools, there was a discussion about um, raising awareness with, within the wider community about the issues associated with healthy weight and how to maintain a healthy weight. And there's a recommendation within the report um, about running a, a media campaign. And that is directed to the, um, our director of, of communications, head of communications within the county council and the director of public health to look at what a media campaign might look like and how it should be targeted, worded. Um, uh, and the, the suggestion was made along the lines of don't be a tosser, which was about you know, not um, throwing rubbish. But that, that was something that the group did come up with. What was interesting is if you look at all the different people we talked to, they almost all were asking us for help. You know, they've sometimes felt, choose my words carefully or in public, that, that they were doing their job, I would say in isolation, but they were doing their best with their job and anything we could do to put, help pull things together and awareness would, would be a help. Um, and the communications plan came from that. But we'll certainly talk about the leaflet. I, I, I think it's not just cost, it's how do you produce a leaflet which doesn't look like some government diktat, bossy diktat, but is actually helpful. Hence the discussion about having something to share good practice. Thank you. Um, Councillor Bryce, you would, would you like to come in? Thank you, Chair. Sorry, I'm not 100% on the etiquette of the Joint Scrutiny Committee work yet, so forgive me if I'm speaking out of turn. But I just felt really strongly to come in at this point. I think there's something really valuable that can be done with regards to engaging with parents because there is so much workload on at teachers and there's only so much that they can do with the hours that they have, children and young people in schools. But it's, I, I agree that we have to be ambitious in tackling this, this complex issue, but some of it doesn't need to be reinventing the wheel. When I used to, to, used to work here in this place, um, there was a fabulous scheme that was run through Suffolk Fire and Rescue Service and I would be happy to engage, through, be that through education scrutiny or, or through you, Chair, um, because Suffolk Fire and Rescue Service have this, this magic knack of reaching the parts, I think it's a lager slogan, isn't it, of reaching the parts that other people can't normally break through um, because the police are rule enforcers, but the fire, fire and Rescue Service have such a strong brand. And I worked very closely with them with their firefighting fit and healthy program that they used to run. And it cut through the parts that other programs didn't quite cut through. Active Lives didn't do it on their own, but they worked in partnership with Fire and Rescue. And what they, whilst there may be capacity issues there, the actual model, I'm sure, could be fairly simply replicated. And it would work with children who had been identified um, as being... I'm going to use the words that we're talking about in the strategy, with being obese, being overweight, having challenges around weight, having challenges in the home setting where families or single parent families weren't sure how to feed their child properly, how to make sure they get the exercise, didn't know themselves, they, perhaps their own background hadn't, hadn't given them that information. So what they did really collectively as a team with the fire and service um, officers, fire officers and active lives, they pulled together to deliver sessions that brought the parents in as well and they made it fun, perish the thought, it was fun. So tackling weight was fun, learning about nutrition was fun, but it was all done around the ethos of teamwork, 
life skills, how you rely on each other in, in a situation, they would do fire drills. So the children would learn the importance of relying on communication with their peers. The parents would be brought in to do the fitness sessions as well, but they weren't fitness sessions that people thought of as, as being difficult. They were, let's play netball together, let's do rounders tonight, let's do something. And they would have the parents against the children's teams and so on. And everybody got involved and everyone got benefit to it. So I think there's already a starting point there in terms of awareness and something that could be lifted and shifted and looked at to look at the that early education of, of parents as well and getting in there with the parents and, and family groups. I think that's something that shouldn't be too difficult to, to kind of bring back to the surface again. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. And um, let's lo note that down as a recommendation to follow up. I'm looking at... Looking at task group members, that's not something that was drawn to our attention, was it? And would you, members of the task and finish group, think that that might be something we, it's here in this organisation, we are the Fire and Rescue Service, can we, we'll find out, I think I'd better say we'll find out if they're still doing it and if they they're, would, would. They're not, it's, I think it was a capacity issue um, or more of a funding, how they continue with the funding, but I think it could be looked at, sorry. Yeah. Is that okay, Theresa? Members, do you agree? Inga, yeah. Councillor Lockington. Uh, yeah. My, my thoughts was really, do we have enough staff in the fire service to, to actually do this? Because, I mean, I haven't heard of them being out to any schools I'm aware of, so it could have been some selected schools they were at. But, um, you know, I, I think it is right. But I, I would also comment that, you know, schools do do a good deal of work when it comes to healthy eating. Yesterday I picked up a lovely little boy after school as I have him on a Tuesday and he had his usual cheese and uh, ham sandwich when he came and he announced he was still hungry and I said, but you've had your school lunch and he told me what he'd had for lunch and I said, was that pudding? So I said, yeah, but I chose an apple because you know, and he told me what the pudding was, he said, because we learned about healthy eating, and I thought it would be easier to, you know, better to have an apple than having a pudding. And I thought, you're absolutely right, and we had a good talk about it. So, schools are doing work. Um, yes, Councillor Marks again. And I'm trying to, I'm racking my brains. Once a year at schools, they have this combined services event, and I've forgotten the name of it. I used to go and teach at it, I should know. Um, you'll know which I mean, and I can't think what it's called now, but every year they have this week at every school. Yeah. Now, I'm just wondering whether you can roll something about obesity into that. I can't think what it's called. Somebody will tell me the name of it in a minute. Crucial Crew. Crucial Crew. So when they're doing Crucial Crew, could they incorporate into Crucial Crew a module about the impact of seriously being overweight and because so many people and parents attend that i think i think one of the biggest problems you have got is the parents accepting their child is obese you you know they're the ta they're your target audience and they are remarkably hard to engage with because they just don't accept it i got my child is tall for his age he's got big bones you have no idea you know, I, I have to say, I was horrified. I, I wasn't getting a breakthrough at all. And that's where you need to be, really. But Crucial Crew is something they really enjoy. So whether you can... Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, it still happens every year. Uh, well, I know the fire service and the police are involved and St John Ambulance, because obviously I used to go and do that. So, so if you could perhaps roll, roll a module into that, I don't know. But it's just a thought, really. Thank you, yes. Thank you. Um, I just want, it is such a huge topic and so many things are springing to mind here. Um, but it's been really, really interesting to read through. I think all the recommendations um, are great. I just wanted to pick up on the leaflet point that Councillor Sower made. I think, and I don't know who you would have to advise on comms, but I would say that um, in terms of families at schools nowadays, we're not, as parents, we're not really used to consuming things through leaflets. It's much more done in a digital sense now, so we get sent PDFs from school. 
and accessing things on our phones. So I really liked the recommendation in here, in ter or some of the information in here in terms of how do we reach parents, how do we reach families. Often it is a digital and online thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was that was the other. Uh, that was one of the points I wanted to make. The other one was just to do with it's the recommendation that uh, that mentions children from uh, different backgrounds. You touch on send, so children uh, with disabilities, and I just wondered whether there's a piece of work or a comment to make in terms of children from different cultures, children from different backgrounds. Do we know? Do we have any stats in terms of obesity on whether it affects boys more than girls or girls more than boys? And any stats based on ethnicity, race? It would just be really interesting and helpful to know. I was just going to say the answer is yes. In public health, have all the data. Would you? I think the hint was if you ask difficult questions that we would put them in an information bulletin for you. But that data is there. We, we, and we were particularly concerned um, about SEND children and their opportunities, but, but we haven't got any you know, massive new recommendations, but we did talk that over. And, and the, we talked over in certainly one of our meetings the cultural issues that exist with, within some communities um, around weight and particularly weight of parents that then impacts on children but again we were looking to have recommendations that were deliverable within these our organizations but we'll, we we did we did have that that information exists I just, um, it was what Councillor Spicer said about keeping this issue at the heart of everything we're doing in terms of the work we all do, in terms of school governance, in terms of all the conversations we're having. I think that is really, really important, keeping this at the forefront. And I would say, I know some of the comments we've made today, um, you know, I know Councillor Marks was saying, you know, being met with resistance from parents and sort of reasons for why things are happening to their children. But what I would say is, as a parent, I've been quite shocked to read some of these statistics and actually conversations we've had recently in school um, with school governance in terms of how active our year five and six children are. And there's this thing about cultural capital at the moment in terms of children want to be online playing with their friends. They're not sitting and reading or they're not going out to the park and playing. And it's that how do we, and that's where I think schools does have a crucial role in how they influence children and parents definitely do as well. But it's actually made me rethink things as a parent because you, you start to feel the peer pressure when your child gets to a certain age. So that also links into what Councillor Fleming said about age-based recommendations because I think the issues we're facing at each stage of a child's life really vary. And just finally, there is a mention in here of um, in terms of when children are weighed at school, so the national programme, it happens in reception, it happens in year six. In those years, we're seeing a vast increase in children who are getting obese. Can we introduce it at year two and year four? You know, intervention. I mean, I found that a really interesting um, bit to read in there because we're, we're sort of missing out on these crucial years, potentially. Thank you. Absolutely agree. I think that we should put in a recommendation to that effect, actually. Um, um, Teresa, go ahead. Um, that was discussed, I think. Um, it, it was something that was raised by the group that year six is too late, one of the reasons being that children are about to move on to their next stage in education and actually you want to catch them a year or maybe two years earlier yes. before they move into high school. The problem with this is it's a nationally dictated programme and we have no influence over it. So we... One of the things, and I think we could try and follow this through a bit more, is the importance of the GP in that four years, yeah. sorry, five, six, five year slot. Because um, that child will see a GP, chances are, a few times in that and if the GP had a well we'll, we'll debate the frequency of child season <laughs> if they can get an appointment is what you're trying to say um, if we could get the assurance which we are looking for that GPs uh, it, it have got they're using their IT systems to identify children I mean a good GP should be taking a look at a child and actually saying did you hop on the scales 
I bet they don't. Right. Um, I, I, I would like to move on to a couple of other councillors who would like to speak. Um, I just wanted to, pull, before I do, though, um, on the subject of GPs and primary care, um, is there a role for social prescribing here? Um, and that, of course, involves GPs and time and... That exists for adults, doesn't it? Well, it, 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 there's no reason why it shouldn't work for children either. And, and just because it doesn't, you know, work for children, you know, why, why not? We, we, we shouldn't be limited. Um, we used to call it exercise on prescription. Teresa, go ahead. Just to say that one of the things that came out in the evidence was the difficulties that GPs have around actually approaching that subject when quite often the child has been taken in for another medical issue for the GP to then broach the topic of weight with the parent is, I think, is found challenging. Um, and so that, that was something really, how, how would you overcome that issue? Is that around training? I mean, their time is limited, to, you know, um, but yeah, they're, they're, it was something that came out in the evidence that GPs actually find it quite a difficult topic to approach when that isn't the concern that the parent has brought to them. I, yes, that's very understandable. Um, is this on this? Yeah, go ahead. Mm, if, if I may. Um, GPs um, today rely on um, the computer IT systems for flagging everything up. Surely, if it was encouraged, um, the GP could have a flash that comes up on their computer which says, measure this child, and it doesn't have to be that they've already been um, described as overweight. It could just be um, something that is the normal and the GP could then actually explain to the parents oh um, I have to do this um, which is where your child I measure your child because it's um, it's part of my contract as it were um, surely it would work that way I don't know um, that, that might be a tricky one to bring in Teresa I don't know if she could give a more accurate answer the GP gets given the results um, of the measuring in reception and in so they've got them um, and you're right I know that there are systems GPs can flag things that, um, apart from flagging uh, chronic disease like um, diabetes or whatever um, if someone has been in a household where domestic violence has been an issue that can be flagged up for, for example um, but Teresa can you help? We're, we did ha have this discussion with BAT GPs, but I can't remember the exact outcomes. Uh, recommendation on page uh, 7, on page 54, there is a, a recommendation there to the Director of Public Health and Communities, that's within the County Council, to seek support from a relevant integrated care board leaders to run a pilot with general practice to understand the extent to which the involvement of primary care in communicating targeted public health messages, which might be wider than just weight management. There could be other um, public health messages that could usefully be communicated. Um, so to run a pilot um, with, with, uh, with primary care. So, and I think that has, um, th there is an indication that that will be taken forward. And I think there was an attempt to run something prior to COVID, which then didn't get um, continued because of COVID. So that is picked up in that recommendation. Great, thank you. Now, um, I know Councillor Shaw is um, longing to come in. Oh, uh, longing, thank you, Chair. Um, I've slightly lost track now because we sort of wandered around different things. I mean, I'll just declare a slight interest because I, w I was a, a teacher in a middle school and uh, more than 20 years of teaching in Suffolk schools. I, I know from my own background that um, schools do a lot, not least Crucial Crew, um, which only stopped during COVID. Um, and I think Crucial Crew is a fine example of 
um, voluntary and services working together with schools um, in year six to um, encourage all sorts of things to do with safety but also healthy eating um, that comes up as part of that and I would also like to put it here that healthy eating comes up in the what used to be the PSHE curriculum and is now something else which I can always never remember because it's changed recently RHSE or something but it's also comes up in the science curriculum and it is covered quite strongly what is missing is the um, uniformity across schools. There is great disparity um, between different schools and I've certainly seen it across Suffolk from my own experience as a teacher but also more recently as a governor. Um, I know that some schools don't do it uh, in such a way and it does depend on the enthusiasms of the staff and the support of the senior staff as well, particularly the head teacher. And there is that running through the whole school system that we have. So I think it's important for us to remember those things. Um, but this is a complex issue and it is societal. Um, I, I'm quite alarmed really that despite massive amount of work in schools and in general public health, things seem to be getting worse, not better. And if we can do anything from this work, which is why I feel so passionate about it. You know, if we can make changes, we're talking about children and young people's mental health as well as physical, because if you're that person, um, that young person in particular, you grow into somebody who's perhaps got massive body image issues and so on. So I think it's such a wide ranging thing, which is why we found it such a challenge in our working group. And I just want to give thanks to um, Councillor Spicer for her um, guidance in all this. <laughs> because kept try to keep us on task brilliantly because it's so difficult to keep focused on such a wide subject. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Marks. Yes, I mean, we sit here and we try to think of things. That the one thing that came across very clearly from parents is that they won't listen to teachers. They regard that as uh, unacceptable. But what they did say was they would listen to medical professionals. Whether that's nurses, doctors, it doesn't actually matter what that medical professional is. They will listen to them. And of course, all children go for inoculations. So why can't you not roll in when they're having their inoculations that they're weighed and then weighed and then given advice? And, and, it, and it's interesting because you need to they need to have a reason to change their ways. And just saying your child is overweight, oh yeah, well they're only two, they'll grow out of it, isn't acceptable. So, so having told them that they're overweight, you then need to give them the risk factors of being overweight and, and make it quite harsh. And, and I highlight this because through a medication I take, I was told I was pre-diabetic and I didn't take any notice until my doctor said, it will impact on your insurance if you go on holiday. That made me sit up and think, lost my weight, stopped eating, and I'm not pre-diabetic anymore. You do need, you do, we all need a little bit more of a shake-up than just being told that, that something is, is, is not acceptable. So I just wonder whether in addition, because there is no one, there's no one quick fix for this, it's pockets of people will behave in different ways. And some of these parents who themselves are massively overweight will not want you to tell them their children are overweight. They simply will not listen. And whilst they are your target audience, you are going to lose a lot of people. But they do all go for inoculations and they do trust those people when they go for it. So if they could be weighed at the same time, perhaps that would be another way of capturing a group of people. Thank you. Um, I think that's, that's a really good recommendation. Um, Councillor Sower. Um, in there is, there is a big problem with, um, I mean, so many parents are already reluctant of vaccinations. And, and if you then combine it with putting the child on a scale, which the child might not like at all, there's a risk you have even fewer parents who vaccinate their children. The other, the other thing is, if you do the scare practice, like, this is going to happen to you if you don't lose weight, Again, you scare parents and children away and they might even visit the GP surgery less or don't let the health visitor in because they're scared. So it's, it's, it's a 
it's a tricky approach to say, oh, scare them, make them aware of what's going to happen to them if they do not lose weight, because this actually might backfire. Thank you. Um, Councillor Richards. No, <clears throat> I understand that the schools have got an awful lot on and it's very difficult for them to actually add this to their list, even though they will be aware of it. And they may not have the facilities, in actual fact, for exercise outside if they don't have <coughs> decent sized playing fields. And my only idea so far would be for the beavers and scouts and the brownies and guides to take some sort of leadership in this to actually get involved with the schools and, and in some way championship, champion it. Uh, because that's the sort of thing they do. They love running around and getting badges for stuff. Uh, it's not just learning, it's about actually doing it as well uh, in a fun way that is not uh, being prescriptive or, or, or talking down to them. That was just, I wondered if that was possible, if you could add that to it. Um, to, uh, Councillor Spicer. Um, I'm building up a list, um, not, no, of, of, of really interesting things that have been raised today. And I, I, I think that I've now got four things that I think we would, if members here were happy, ask officers to look, just to make inquiries, not necessarily change. Um, and working backwards, I think your, your thought about um, is it extracurricular or whatever the word is, activities, cadets, brownies, scouts, guides, lots of different cadets, St. John. Um, uh, I, do they have a collective of any sort? I, I bet Margaret would know. Do you know? If <coughs> yes, but I don't think, I don't know if there's a way we can communicate with all the brownie leaders and all the guide leaders and all the, do you know? Could you use your microphone, Councillor, please? Yes, I know that the scouts and, and the guides are, are talk to each other, but um, I, I don't think they talk to the people outside of their particular... I think it might be in the too difficult, unless we can find a way collectively to talk to large groups of them, saying, you know, would you like any help, any advice? Is it something... I mean, most of them do involve exercise of some, some sort, to be fair. But I... I I don't want to make something too difficult because they try, the communication isn't easy. The, the, it's a very hierarchical organisation, the guides and scouts. If you were to talk to the head of the guides and scouts and brownies, it would go all the way down, right through county, no trouble at all. But you need to teach, because I said it's, it's very hierarchical. What, what I'm saying, Debbie, is there's yeah. also cadets. And cadets yes, and all the rest uh, of lots them. Of, uh, all the different military cadet units. And they start at eight, a lot of them start at seven and eight years old. Um, yeah. And St. John, Beavers. Beavers? Beavers and yeah. Scouts, yes. Yes. The Beavers no, and the Mini Scouts. Badgers. Badgers. Yeah, and, and so on. So we, we, we'll make some inquiries if there's a way to communicate, but it could be. Um, whilst I'm talking, um, in terms of inoculations programme, could we ask? officers to just make an inquiry over how that works. I don't know whether we can require anybody to weigh, but my experience of inoculations, which might be a touch out of date as my children are in their 40s, um, is a, a nurse has the information in front of them anyway, um, because if you've taken your child in, hopefully the nurse has put the screen up with that child's name, and if we've got a, a system, which we've already talked about, that where the primary care professionals have got a flagging system. That might be a way in. But I think the important point you're making, and we need to make sure it's brought out, is that there's a whole range of health professionals that have access to data about a child. Um, two quick things, crucial crew and fire and rescue service programmes, um, neither of which came up. I think we would, we'll make inquiries as to what happens at the minute and whether, and, and I wouldn't hesitate to ask members of the task and finish group if we could add a recommendation, if it makes sense. But it, it could be these things are happening anyway. I'm not sure what goes on with Crucial Crew anymore. But we'll talk to the Fire and Rescue Service to see if, if they could be persuaded. 
probably have to be bribed. Um, we'll look at that. So the new idea, if that's all right with you, Chairman. Yes, that, absolutely. They do have some downtime, so maybe, uh, but, they, but they have also, they, they, there's obviously uncertainty about their availability in case there's an incident. So it would have to be um, on that basis. <clears throat> I just wanted to add while we're on this subject that um, you know, some of the notes I'd made when I read it, um, the three lines of inquiry, um, focusing on schools, obviously schools can't do it all, but is enough information coming into schools about other opportunities for physical activity? Um, obviously we've talked about um, sports clubs, dance, volunteering, um, brownies and guides we've talked about, the Duke of Edinburgh award program, park run, which we've discussed. Um, how are these things introduced to students? How are students encouraged to, to know what's available even? Um, never mind to, to actually be able to access some of these activities. Um, you know, on, on a wet day when I was at school, we did dancing in the gym. Do schools have gyms these days? I mean, surely they could have put on dance classes on a wet day. I, I know there's so many things that could be done. Oh, I suppose, I, they used to always be done. I, I'm just not sure why they aren't being done now. Can, can I just leap in very fast? I mean, they are being done. Um, in any schools that I know of. Um, they have lunchtime activities of such a, a sort, um, certainly after school. Uh, some schools have close links with the youth teams locally. Um, different community groups bring posters into the school or they communicate on social media. So I, I think a lot of info does go into the schools and it's obviously given to parents as well as children. Um, there's only so much, you can take horses to water, uh, using the old, but you can't always make them drink. Francis. It was only a very, a very brief thing about what, what the modern version of what you've just described is. Apparently during wet play at school, um, you can do just dance from YouTube or yoga on YouTube and they, they're in the classrooms, so they're doing the physical activity and it might not be in a gym, but I know this kind of stuff is often promoted, but it is a good point. <laughs> okay. Um, and I, I suppose there's the, the question is, um, I think that you've alluded to, um, Councillor Shaw, is that possibly the children who are a bit overweight are the ones who won't be as keen to engage in these things. So it's a bit of a self-perpetuating problem. Um, and you know, that's obviously a tough one to overcome. Um, let's see. The one of the recommendations which we've debated long and hard is currently there's this mile a day, daily mile, sorry. Um, and we've actually rather bravely setting a target or recommending that a target be set to get more schools. Teresa, can you take us to the page, which quickly, I'm sure you can do it quicker than me, about the Daily, mi the daily Mile? That's page 53, recommendation 1B. And we've, we've had a great debate about setting a target, because you know that was something we felt was actually so important that schools could latch on to. So we've, we're, we're, we're recommending, I mean, up to the Health and Wellbeing Board, I think, to decide if they run with that, but that we really um, ought to try and increase that. And that fits with what, what you're suggesting, Chairman, about schools actually getting imaginatively proactive. Um, you mentioned, that, or the report mentions, that the Task and Finish Group was informed that about 100 primary schools are registered for the Daily Mile. But how many primary schools are there in Suffolk? Okay, so uh, the target would be to increase that by about another 80 schools. Well, incrementally, 80 primary schools. Yeah, over, over two years. Over two, two years. So... 
with 100 schools, so it would be by 40 schools, 40% 40 of 100, increase it by 40%. So there's 100 schools currently undertaking it. They want to increase it by 40% in the first year and 30% in the second year. Okay. Uh, sorry, and 20% in year three. So it would be an in incremental because they'll get the easy wins first. So those that are more likely to participate once they've been encouraged, um, it's going to get increasingly difficult uh, in the following year and so on. Yeah. Uh, um just while I'm in the chair, so to speak, um, I noticed that um, the minimum activity level is set. Um, uh, the minimum recommendation is 60 minutes or one hour a day. Um, and that presumably comes from the Department for Education, but I wasn't sure where it came from. And um, also that there is some funding um, for, for activity up to 30 minutes a day. That's on page 44 of our report. Um, do we know what that funding is doing? Or you know, have I missed it in, in the report? Is that funding being put to good use? Choose my words carefully as we're in an open meeting, um, we weren't entirely sure from some of the evidence that the money which is there and allocated was always being used as it should. I mean, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting anything fraudulent, but um, it was quite difficult to badge up, hence the recommendation 11 at the top of page 45 to try and, and, and see if we could be helpful. Right, so, but is that... Is that saying that we would like to know how that money is used? Do we want that to come back to us? Um, or is it just saying we're not sure how it's being used as a statement? Because I, I think it's quite important that we know how it's being used. Um, schools are currently required to publish how they have used it on their website, but it's not collated centrally. That's the difficulty with it. So the amount that schools are receiving is published nationally mm -hmm. and schools are then required to publish what they have done with the money on their own website but there's no central oversight so there is a recommendation there around trying to strengthen that oversight. Great, okay, sorry. And, and I've got one other point and that um, relates to planning and the um, playing fields. I think um, it would be very alarming if our own school programs um, were not providing the very minimum. In fact, you know, I had jotted down a suggestion that maybe the county council should exceed the minimum <coughs> target and embody that into our own policies, that we're actually going to have more playing field and playground space than the minimum requirement. It's part of our our own education policy, and, and it, it relates to planning as well. So I'm just wondering if anyone feels that that's realistic or would it meet with a lot of resistance? I think Theresa will correct me. I wrote to the cabinet member and the um, director for children things before the <coughs> cabinet paper, asking them to give me an assurance that it did meet. And I'm pretty sure I haven't had an answer. So with your help, please, Councillor Fleming, we will seek an answer. Very good. Um, what do members feel about the County Council adopting a, um, a more ambitious target than the minimum? Uh, yes, I just, it would be absolutely lovely. I'm just thinking about the school the county has approved in the middle of Ipswich in an, the old co-op building, it certainly doesn't have any playgrounds at all, I think. So, you know, that is the problem. You know, you, I don't know how these children who one day will end up going to school there will have all this exercise. And can I just say to also, it's absolutely right, um, I learned from a school in my area that um, they all schools have to publicize on their website how they spent the pupils' premium. The, the, not pupil, but the sports premium. 
it has to be on the website. Some schools are good at doing it, but clearly others don't. Thank you very much. Now, I've got two people. One, I think Councillor Maybury, you wanted to speak, and then um, Councillor Brooks. Yes, um, thank you, Chairman. And um, Councillor Lockington's really sort of beaten, beaten me to it. Uh, but a primary school in, in my ward um, had extra development, which left them with zero playing area. Um, and so County Council have had to look at alternatives. Um, and th and this, is, this is the issue. I think we, we are now, I'm going to say, reaping the rewards from the extra building around our schools. Um, in, in my opinion, instead of building new schools, because we have lost playing, playing fields and play areas for children. And that is such a shame because my stand with young people, especially in Suffolk, is they should have the best. Not just the ordinary, but the best. Because if we give our young people the best, we try and influence them to make them the best, then we will get the best rewards in the end. They are going to be the leaders of our communities in the future. We need to give them the best. So yes, I would be delighted if Councillor Spicer would take back to her colleagues um, at the County Council that um, building on the playing field areas in our schools is the wrong thing to do and they should look at providing extra schools. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that feeds into recommendation two, doesn't it? Um, Councillor Bryce. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I would also echo the, the comments made um, by several members now about the, the playground spaces. And I think we should, as a county, be more ambitious on this front. And we should be aiming not for the gold standard, but for the platinum standard for our, our children and young people. Um, the other aspect I wanted to, to raise um, with your allowance, please, Chairman, is around, also in planning, is around road safety in consideration with highways, because that is the biggest deterrent um, as a county councillor rep representing 26 very rural parishes. Uh, many of my parishes and villages don't have footpaths or pavements, um, and the schools are encouraging the parents to walk their children. Um, there's nowhere to park the cars when they drive their children to the school. It creates a greater safety hazard. I think, for example, in Little Beelings, there is no pavement whatsoever. There is no parking whatsoever. Um, so in another role, I'm vice chair of East Suffolk. Um, it's a very long-winded community partnership, one of the sub-boards that represents my division. Um, and one of the things we're, we're looking at very much over there is around road safety, what we can do um, to support the schools in supporting their families to be able to walk to school safely and educating the parents that actually you live in the village envelope, you can walk to the school. There is no pavement in some places. There are no places to create pavement. Um, but it's what initiatives we can do, and it's, it's around the Suffolk Road Safe Partnership as well. And we, we provide sort of high-vis jackets and things like that, and walking trains to school. But I think there is a role for county in terms of highways and its role with planning in part of that ambition to make sure that we are thinking carefully about further development in this area. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, I think that's a really good point. I, too, I sit on the West Suffolk Community Safety Partnership, and funnily enough, um, we started to talk about road safety as a barrier to, um, well, it wasn't particularly in children, but for, for walking and cycling. And, um, you know, so I think both of the, com the partnerships should take this up. It would probably be a stronger argument. Um, the only other issue I'd like to mention is the, um, the LC WIPs, the Local Cycling and Walking Infrastructure Plans, that I think districts and boroughs are pre preparing. I believe there is a county-wide LC whip as well that the county council um, has developed. Um, I think I'm correct there, Teresa. But it's it's a local cycling and walking infrastructure plan, and yeah, districts and boroughs are preparing them, and they are intended to um, be fed into the planning system so that um, there are costed projects ready to go. If they can't be funded now, then they would be funded through SIL or 106, depending on what system you know, the um, district is using. And 
that they can qualify for um, Department for Transport funds if they meet the DFT requirements. However, the DFT requirements are very suburban, and most of our rural areas uh, struggle to meet them. So we, that source of funding is not available for the most part. Um, however, it again feeds into the planning system. And I think this report will go to the Health and Wellbeing Board. We have representatives from district and borough councils at that board. And that's why we've got a Health and Wellbeing Board, is to integrate our thinking. And, and I think planning and the planning system, both at county council and district and borough level, you know, need, needs, needs to be part of the solution here as well. And, and you know, I, I would probably be having a word with the chairman of the Health and, Health and Wellbeing Board to make sure that you know, these things are taken seriously. Um, just just a, a point I wanted to make there. In, in just trying to make it more um, <clears throat> encouraging to, 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 to walk and, and cycle. Just one more thing before I, I hand over to you, Joe. One of the recommendations also was noted weather-related barriers to getting to school, which you know, are fairly obvious in England, um, and selective use of, of the bus pass, so that the bus pass could be used maybe in the more clement months um, at maybe a reduced price or something allowing the child to um, not pay a penalty for not using the bus when the weather's good. I, I, th I thought that was a really good recommendation. I think it's on page 40, para 38. Um, I, I think it would be good if we could just look at that again and make sure that that carries through, if, if it's possible to do. Thank you. Can you para 30? We, we, we haven't actually put that in a, a formal recommendation, have we? Do you think you might consider it? Because I thought it was a brilliant idea. Is it yes. doable? Yeah. One of our difficulties all along was hearing about interesting and innovative and curious and wacky <laughs> ideas to actually then know is this something which we could recommend and who would pay and what would it cost and how would it be rolled out um, but I, I think if it's the wish of this committee we'll certainly look at that again but we didn't have a lot of detail I, I, I think it's worth looking at again and, and I, I realize that it, it may have practical um, hurdles, but, but um, it would certainly take into account the fact that, you know, most people aren't going to walk or cycle to school when it's pouring with rain and wind in the winter. It's just not going to happen. Um, I just want to go back very briefly to the whole playing fields, open space, green space, um, which we, first to be clear, I don't think the County Council, when they have built on any playground or playing field, it has been for school provision, not houses or anything. We're not, you know, and we're not allowed to sell playing fields without the permission of the Secretary of State, even if you've closed the school. So we're, we're not quite as cavalier as you might think. Um, we're not popping houses all over playgrounds. The, the problem is where school numbers have expanded. Some schools are getting smaller and smaller, actually, but where they've expanded, that with the, and, and particularly with phasing out of middle schools, extra classrooms or facilities, new school halls, whatever, have been built. Um, but I, I think there is a really important thing here for the district and borough councils. Um, I was walking through an estate in one of my villages, which was built, I think, I imagine in the late 70s, early 80s. And there was a playing field, playing area, trees, grass, everything, the size of a football pitch, bigger, two football pitches. I mean, it would take five minutes to walk from one side to the other. And yet now, I mean, the plans I'm looking at for Ixworth, the bit of green lung in the middle is about the size of this room, and you certainly couldn't cook a kick a football. Um, and, and this is a problem which I know the district planners and our own have with developers. 
is that every square inch that can put... And, of course, everyone's got much smaller gardens, too, that are built now. Um, uh, and, you know, not, not so much about just growing vegetables, but there is, is there room for a child to kick a football in a garden anymore? So the, there is an awareness. It's not easy, but I'm not trying to say that it's a quick, easy, easily done. But it's important, and we will talk about it when we go to the Health and Wellbeing Board. Planners, I do wonder whether they should be planning officers much more firm, right at the beginning with a developer or landowner coming forward with the housing proposals about a percentage of green space that they expect, rather than just a twee little green the size of this room in the middle. Um, absolutely agree with you, um, Joanna, but unfortunately the incentives for, for districts, well, particularly districts, to to have as many homes as possible. The financial incentives are very great, and um, they're not as great to provide open space for public use. Um, Councillor Marks. Just trying to you know, constantly think outside the box here, really. One of the children today, and I, I know um, with my own family's children now, we're a very active family, we're very lucky. They spend a disproportionate amount of time on these violent games on the internet, and I mean a disproportionate amount of time. But one of the things, if you go back three or ten years probably, was the we. You remember the introduction of the we? And all families tended to be bashing something around in their, in their living room. And it was, it was amazing. And I just wonder whether it's worth talking to some of the new games industries and saying, look, you know, these kids, they want to play these violent games, that's fine, but can, they, can you introduce something where they have to actually get off their chair? Because the we was really successful and I know families that still play it, you know, it was a great... No, 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 this was a... You, you had, a, you had an, a tennis racket and, and you were playing against the television. You could actually play television. Did you not see it? I mean, it was, you could play all sorts of games and I tell you, it was jolly active. You'd fall over a coffee table about eight times a day as you ran around. But it was, jo it was <coughs> terrific. But you know what, we, we've now got, and certainly at the... Um, and it might be worth, there's a chap at the... Um, the epicentre in, in Haverhill, who's developing, he's a game, technology games developer. It might just be worth saying, you know, because these kids, they are, go we can't, we're not going to stop this. We're not going to stop them spending an inordinate amount of time on their computer. It's the way of the future. But what we could do is make the games that they have to get off their seat and actually do something. And, and maybe it's worth having that conversation with them, you know, because unfortunately, they don't, they, you know, this is one of the... Well, it's worth the conversation, though, John, isn't it? Yeah. Members, I'm going to have to, um, let's see, two people's hands shot up. Um, Councillor Robinson and Councillor Bryce. Sorry, Chair, I was just going to say that we are getting a little bit off beam here because things like game development are commercial operations, not social operations. Sorry, did you repeat what you said? I said we're getting, going off a little bit off beam here because things like game developers are commercial operators they are not there for the benefit of the public they are there to make money and unfortunately the games industry does what it needs to make money not for social value um, nice idea um, the we was a thing but people don't want that sort of thing anymore so they don't buy that sort of thing anymore so you won't, can't get it anymore going to move on, um, Councillor Bryce, and then I think we need to wind up and, um, and end the meeting. Thank you, Chairman. I'll be very brief. Um, whilst I welcome the, the ambition of speaking to the gaming developers about the, the violent, you know, the, you said they're going to play the violent games come what may, they, they will do so, and unfortunately I agree. I would also urge caution about making those games active, because given the atrocities that we're seeing in the States, I would not like to see children running around with um, remote, fake weapon type devices um, the final con comment I'd like to make with your discretion please chair is I sh would have made it at the start but I did say that I'm my naivety in, in joint committee working um, I would like to put on record as chair of education children services scrutiny I'd like to put on record my huge thanks to councillor Spicer and the task and finish group 
for the outstanding work they've done on this report. Um, and there's still further work to do on it, given the, the conversation that's gone on here today. But I would really like to say that I have absolutely no hesitation that um, Councillor Newman would be inordinately proud of the work that you and your colleagues have done on this. And I thank you and I'm happy to endorse the report. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that's brilliant. And uh, I echo those words. And we will, I think, um, Theresa and Julie have quite a job to make sense of any additional suggestions or parallel notes that the Health Scrutiny Committee might have come up with um, alongside the excellent work that this task and finish group has accomplished. You've been so thorough and um, it, it's, it's really been a most successful um, venture. So I also thank you very much. And um, I'm going to conclude the meeting. Um, thank you all for coming and um, we'll see you next time. Sorry, yes, I'm, I'm seconding, yes, our chair there. We, providing everyone agrees, yes, we endorse them. Thank you.